Section 118 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 1, China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Edited by Eva March Teppen. Section 118. The Schools of Old Japan. By Francis Ottiwell Adams. Secretary of the Legation at Yedo The Japanese lad began his education at the age of six or seven years. There were three grades of schools, Shō, Shiyu, and Daigaku, small, middle, and grade school. In many of the daimyo's capitals the latter was wanting. The one in Yedo might, with some show of propriety, be called a university. The Japanese pupil took his first steps in learning by mastering the hiragana and katakana alphabet or syllabary he must know how to read and write both styles before he begin the study of chinese characters the average boy spent five years in the sho or primary school during the first year he began the study of the chinese classics the method of learning these books was to go through each one studying the sound only of each character a japanese lad must therefore know the sound of every character in the book before he had an idea of what a single one of them meant. This is as if an English boy attacking Homer or the Hebrew Bible were to learn to read the book through pronouncing every word carefully, but knowing nothing of its meaning or the construction of the language. But in case of the Japanese lad, he must learn nearly 2,000 characters and several hundred sounds before receiving an explanation of their meaning. The books mastered as to sense and meaning during the years spent in the primary school were the small learning, the moral duties of man, Confucius's four books of moral, the three character book of morals, the book of filial duties, the book of great lineage, ancestry of the Mikado, and the entrance to knowledge, duties of cleanliness, obedience, etc. The scholar's work during the first year was with Kana and the sound of Chinese characters. In the second year the writing of Chinese characters was begun, and continued thenceforward as a never-ending part of his education. He learned to write the names of all the emperors, of all the large cities, provinces, and the geographical divisions of Japan, his own name and that of his family, the names of streets, familiar objects, the characters for points of the compass, the seasons, names of countries, of years, chronological era, etc., and to read and copy proclamations and edicts on the notice boards. During the third year, the Japanese lad learned the four rudimentary rules of arithmetic and the use of the abacus, a point at which the mathematical education of a vast majority of Japanese ended. He also read the Book of Heroes, a book containing biographies of model men and women, moral anecdotes, accounts of virtuous and noble actions, etc. The study of the Chinese classics was continued. Much time was spent in writing Chinese characters, and several hours a week were given to the practical study of etiquette, how to walk, to bow, to visit, to talk, etc. Examinations were held twice a year, at which the daimyo, or high officials, were present and delivered prizes to the most diligent and successful, who were then graduated into the chiu, or middle school. Hitherto, the education was moral and intellectual. In middle school, the physical education began. The course comprised three years, during which daily lessons either in fencing, wrestling or spear exercise, and a monthly practice on horseback under expert instructors were parts of the curriculum. It would be tedious to detail all the studies of the middle school, but in substance they were simply an advance on the line of studies in the small school. The lad reads The History of China, The Book of Rhetoric, A Brief History of Japan, and a large book on Japanese strategy containing remarkable feats in war, narratives of heroes, etc. They learned the various styles of Chinese learning, how to write official and private letters, both original and after models. In arithmetic they learned to count large numerical quantities and to solve problems by the four fundamental rules. They studied the topography of Japan with considerable thoroughness and read an epitome on universal geography. In the Dai, or high school, the students spent more time in the gymnasium and on the riding course, becoming proficient in riding, wrestling, archery, fencing, long and short spear exercise, and in the various arts by which an unarmed man 
may defend his life and injure his enemy. And their reading now took a higher range, embracing well-known historical classics. In arithmetic, vulgar and decimal fractions, the rule of three, involution, evolution, and progression were taught. A little algebra was introduced into some of the schools, but only a small minority of students reached the maximum of mathematical studies presented above. In the Seido, or old Chinese college in Yedo, the course of literary study ranged somewhat higher, and original composition in Chinese was made a specialty. The usual time allotted for study in all the schools was six hours a day, from 6 to 12 a.m. in the summer, from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. in the spring and autumn, and from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. in the winter. No long vacation was given in summer, but regular holidays throughout the year were numerous, and at the beginning of the year the schools were closed for several weeks. In general, the disciplinary rules of the schools were strictly observed. Each scholar must wear a hakama, or trousers formally distinguishing the samurai. If late, he could not enter the school for that day. When once in, he was not allowed to leave till school was out. The rewards at the end of the year were pieces of silk, ink stones, brush pens, paper, silver coin, and the highest at the Chinese college in Yedo was a robe on which the crest of the shogun was embroidered, with the privilege of always wearing the garment in public. The most common punishments were confinement to the room or house, whipping in front of the leg or on the back, walking up and down for several hours with one of the small writing tables on the head, having the moksha burned on the forefinger, etc. Of the teachers, some taught only the sound of the characters, others the meaning of separate characters, others were expounders or exegetes. Writing, arithmetic, and each athletic exercise were taught by special instructors. Few of the teachers made teaching their permanent work, and of the scholars, probably not more than a third completed the full course of studies. It was absolutely necessary, however, that the samurai should have been at least through the small school. Without this rudimentary education, he could not become a householder. End of section 118. This recording is in the public domain. Section 119 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Abai in February 2018. The World's Story, Volume 1 China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 119. How to Learn Japanese. By Rev. M. L. Gordon, M.D. The young missionary starts to his field filled with enthusiasm and elated by the thought of preaching Christ's salvation to those who have never heard the good news of God. He may not actually entertain the idea, so commonly heard at home, that his first work on landing will be to repeat the old, old story to the astonished but receptive natives as they kneel in homage at his feet. He may think of his lack of knowledge of the language as an obstacle to immediate preaching, but he has doubtless been encouraged to regard this obstacle as of a very temporary character, and he indulges the pleasing hope that a few weeks, or a few months at the farthest, will find him speaking like a native. When he reaches his destination, however, his complacency receives a terrible shock. Geographically speaking, he is now near the people whom he hopes to teach, but as far as actual teaching is concerned, a broader ocean than the Pacific still rolls between him and them. As he listens to the shouts of the boatmen who crowd around his ship, or the chattering of the jinrikisha men while they draw lots for the privilege of carrying him to his hotel, he understands, as never before, why the Russians call foreigners the dumb, the speechless, and say even of modern English travellers, Look at these people, they make a noise but cannot speak. And he is ready, without further investigation, to call the Japanese barbarians, in the sense that the Greeks used the word barbaros, that is, as designating all who spoke a language unintelligible to themselves. The language, the language, what an alpine barrier to all communication with the people he would teach. 
there are it is true a few a gradually increasing number who understand english and eager for immediate results he may confine himself to these or he may use one of these english-speaking japanese as an interpreter in preaching to others with the american theological student who felt that he had a special call to labor among educated young ladies as a precedent why should he not choose some such restricted work or he may imitate the example of scotland's most famous missionary to the chinese who even before he reached his destination attempted to teach the doctrine of the atonement to the boatmen who came alongside the ship by going through the motions of washing a garment but if he be too wise to depend upon such imperfect methods unless he has gone there for some special work such as the teaching of english determine that even the alps shall not keep him out of italy and so procuring the best books on the subject and engaging the best available living teacher he will tackle the language in real earnest and this will seem but the beginning of his troubles if he secure a teacher who understands english he will find himself talking in english about the japanese language learning something of the science of the language perhaps but making little or no progress in the art of speaking it most probably he will be teaching ten times as much english to his teacher as he learns japanese from him on the other hand if he employs a teacher who knows no english the result will be two persons together in a room with no knowledge of each other's language and no means of communication except signs and the japanese english dictionary striving to see which can the sooner tire out and disgust the other our friend begins in a concrete way by inquiring the names of the most familiar things about the house using the one sentence given him by an older missionary kore wa nani tomoshimasu ka what is this in answer to his question he is told that the rice on the table is called meshi all vowels it should be remarked have the continental pronunciation rejoicing in this knowledge he begins making sentences i eat meshi the little child likes meshi no says his mentor in speaking of a child's rice it is better to use the word mama the child likes mama undiscouraged the student tries again do you eat meshi when his teacher stops him and tells him that it is polite in speaking to another of his having or eating rice to call it gozen having taken this in he goes on with his sentence building the merchant sells gozen when the teacher again calls a halt and tells him that meshi and gozen are used for cooked rice only and that for unboiled rice kome is the proper word feeling that he is now getting into the secrets of the language he says kome grows in the fields when he is again stopped with the information that growing rice is called ine he next picks up a carpenter's rule and is told that the foot measure is called shaku he is glad to find that it is just about twelve inches in length but is nonplussed when he learns that the tailor's shaku measures fifteen inches his perplexity increases on finding that when he sends for a kin pound of beef he gets five sixths of an avoir du poids pound if he sends for a kin of flour he gets one and one third pounds while if he purchase a kin of sugar it is within a small fraction of two pounds in starting on a journey he is told that one ri is equal to two and one half english miles but if in passing through certain districts he be puzzled because of the unexpectedly long distances he may be told that there it takes three and a half miles to make a ri on the other hand in ascending fuji and other mountains the traveller often finds that the real distance is only about one half of that marked on the milestones because as he is gravely told the ascent requires a double amount of exertion he finds all of the provinces and some cities with two names each and the country now divided into prefectures with still different names while till very recently 
the main island of Japan had no name whatever. Filled with dismay and despair at the confusion into which his teacher has introduced him, he turns for relief to the books on the language prepared by European scholars, and reads for his encouragement from the latest authority upon the subject such sentences as these. Japanese nouns have no gender or number. Japanese adjectives no degrees of comparison. Japanese verbs no persons. Strictly speaking, there are but two parts of speech. The prepositions are postpositions. Most sentences are subjectless. It is not that the subjects are dropped, but still understood as in other languages. They do not exist in the mind of the speaker. The Japanese language abhors pronouns. The verb is often omitted. The normal Japanese sentence is a paragraph. The order of the words is often the exact reverse of that in English. Thus, to give rice to a beggar would in Japanese be kojiki ni meshi wo yaru, beggar to rice give. Still further, the Japanese do not write as they speak, but use an antiquated and partially artificial dialect whenever they put pen to paper. End of section 119「Section 120 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The World Story, Volume 1 china japan and the islands of the pacific edited by eve march tappan section 120 the attack upon port arthur by lieutenant tagigoshi sakurai of the imperial japanese army as soon as we were gathered together the colonel rose and gave us a final word of exhortation saying this battle is our great chance of serving our country. Tonight we must strike at the vitals of Port Arthur. Our brave assaulting column must be not simply a forlorn hope, resolved to die, but a sure death detachment. I, as your father, am more grateful than I can express for your gallant fighting. Do your best, all of you. Yes we were all ready for death when leaving japan men going to battle of course cannot expect to come back alive but in this particular battle to be ready for death was not enough what was required of us was a determination not to fail to die indeed we were sure death men and this new appellation gave us a great stimulus also a telegram that had come from the minister of war in tokyo was read by the aide-de-camp which said i pray for your success this increased the exultation of our spirits let me now recount the sublimity and horror of this general assault i was a mere lieutenant and everything passed through my mind as in a dream so my story must be something like picking out things from the dark i can't give you any systematic account but must limit myself to fragmentary recollections if this story sounds like a vainglorious account of my own achievements it is not because i am conscious of my merit when i have so little to boast of but because the things concerning me and near me are what i can tell you with authority if this partial account prove a clue from which the whole story of this terrible assault may be inferred my work will not have been in vain the men of the sure death detachment rose to their part fearlessly they stepped forward to the place of death they went over pan lung shan and made their way through the piled-up bodies of the dead 
groups of five or six soldiers reaching the barricaded slope one after the other i said to the colonel good-bye then with this farewell i started and my first step was on the head of a corpse our objective points were the northern fortress and wang tai hill there was a fight with bombs at the enemy's skirmish trenches the bombs sent from our side exploded finely and the place became at once a conflagration boards were flung about sandbags burst heads flew around legs were torn off the flames mingled with the smoke lighted up our faces weirdly with a red glare and all at once the battle line became confused then the enemy thinking it hopeless left the place and began to flee forward forward now is the time to go forward forward pursue capture it with one bound and proud of our victory we went forward courageously captain kawakami raising his sword cried forward and then i standing close by him cried sakurai's company forward thus shouting i left the captain's side and in order to see the road we were to follow went behind the rampart what is that black object which obstructs our view it is the ramparts of the northern fortress looking back i did not see a soldier alack had the line been cut in trepidation keeping my body to the left for safety i called the twelfth company lieutenant sakurai a voice called out repeatedly in answer returning in the direction of the sound i found corporal ito weeping loudly what are you crying for what has happened the corporal weeping bitterly gripped my arm tightly lieutenant sakurai you have become an important person what is there to weep about i say what is the matter he whispered in my ear our captain is dead hearing this i too wept was it not only a moment ago that he had given the order forward was it not even now that i had separated from him and yet our captain was one of the dead in one moment our tender pitying captain kawakami and i had become beings of two separate worlds was it a dream or a reality i wondered corporal ito pointed out the captain's body which had fallen inside the rampart only a few rods away i hastened thither and raised him in my arms captain i could not say a word more but as matters could not remain thus i took the secret map which the captain had and rising up boldly called out from henceforward i command the twelfth company and i ordered that some one of the wounded should carry back the captain's corpse a wounded soldier was just about to raise it up when he was struck on a vital spot and died leaning on the captain one after another of the soldiers who took his place was struck and fell i called sub-lieutenant ninomiya and asked him if the sections were together he answered in the affirmative i ordered corporal ito not to let the line be cut and told him that i would be in the centre of the skirmishers in the darkness of the night we could not distinguish the features of the country nor in which direction we were to march standing up abruptly against the dark sky were the northern fortress and wang tai hill in front of us lay a natural stronghold and we were in a cauldron shaped hollow but still we marched on side by side the twelfth company forward i turned to the right and went forward as in a dream i remember nothing clearly of the time keep the line together this was my one command presently i ceased to hear the voice of corporal ito who had been at my right hand the bayonets gleaming in the darkness became fewer the black masses of soldiers who had pushed their way on now became a handful 
all at once as if struck by a club i fell down sprawling on the ground i was wounded struck in my right hand the splendid magnesium light of the enemy flashed out showing the piled up bodies of the dead and i raised my wounded hand and looked at it it was broken at the wrist the hand hung down and was bleeding profusely i took out the already loosened bundle of bandages footnote the first aid bandages prepared by the red cross society issued to every soldier as part of his equipment End footnote tied up my wound with a triangular piece and then wrapping my handkerchief over it i slung it from my neck with the sunrise flag which i had sworn to plant on the enemy's fortress looking up i saw that only a valley lay between me and wang tai hill which almost touched the sky i wished to drink and sought at my waist but the canteen was gone its leather strap alone was entangled in my feet the voices of the soldiers were lessening one by one in contrast the glare of the rockets of the hated enemy and the frightful noise of the cannonading increased i slowly rubbed my legs and seeing that they were unhurt i again rose throwing aside the sheath of my sword i carried the bare blade in my left hand as a staff went down the slope as in a dream and climbed wang tai hill the long and enormously heavy guns were towering before me and how few of my men were left alive now i shouted and told the survivors to follow me but few answered my call when i thought that the other detachments must also have been reduced to a similar condition my heart began to fail me no reinforcement was to be hoped for so i ordered a soldier to climb the rampart and plant the sun flag overhead but alas he was shot and killed without even a sound or cry all of a sudden a stupendous sound as from another world rose around about me counter assault a detachment of the enemy appeared on the rampart looking like a dark wooden barricade they surrounded us in the twinkling of an eye and raised a cry of triumph our disadvantageous position would not allow us to offer any resistance and our party was too small to fight them we had to fall back down the steep hill looking back i saw the russians shooting at us as they pursued when we reached the earthworks before mentioned we made a stand and faced the enemy great confusion and infernal butchery followed bayonets clashed against bayonets the enemy brought out machine guns and poured shot upon us pell-mell the men on both sides fell like grass but i cannot give you a detailed account of the scene because i was then in a dazed condition i only remember that i was bandishing my sword in fury i also felt myself occasionally cutting down the enemy i remember a confused fight of white blade against white blade the rain and hail of shell a desperate fight here and a confused scuffle there at last i grew so hoarse that i could not shout any more suddenly my sword broke with a clash my left arm was pierced i fell and before i could rise a shell came and shattered my right leg i gathered all my strength and tried to stand up but i felt as if i were crumbling and fell to the ground perfectly powerless a soldier who saw me fall cried lieutenant sakurai let us die together i embraced him with my left arm and gnashing my teeth with regret and sorrow i could only watch the hand-to-hand -hand fight going on about me my mind worked like that of a madman but my body would not move an inch end of section one hundred and twenty the recording is in the public domain
Section 121 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Read for LibriVox.org by Sarah Hale. Japan, Part 5. Little Stories of Japan. Historical Note. The art and literature of Japan date from about the 5th century A.D. Books on history, philosophy, and kindred subjects were written in the Chinese language. Poetry, plays, and fiction in Japanese. Daily newspapers were unknown in Japan until 1871. At first, they suffered much inconvenience from the government's habit of imprisoning editors whose views did not meet with its approval. But this difficulty was finally overcome by hiring dummy editors whose sole duties were to go to jail. In the realm of decorative art, the Japanese are unsurpassed. Unlike the artists of the Western world, the Japanese do not attempt to copy the object painted, but to set down their impression of it. End of section 121 this recording is in the public domain. Section 122 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Read for LibriVox.org by April 6090, California, United States of America. Japanese Politeness by Mortimer Menpes. One of the most remarkable illustrations of the native politeness that I have ever witnessed is in Tokyo. A man pulling along a cart loaded high with boughs of trees chanced to catch the roof of a coolie's house in one of his pieces of timber, tearing away a large portion of it, for a roof is a very slim affair in Japan. The owner of the house rushed out thoroughly upset and began to expostulate and to explain how very distressing it was to have one's roof torn off in this manner. No doubt, if he had been a Britisher, he would have used quaint language, but there are no swear words in the Japanese language. They are too polite a people. The abused one stood calmly, with arms folded, listening to the harangue, and saying nothing. Only when the enraged man had finished, he pointed to the towel, which in his haste the coolie had forgotten to take off his head. At once the coolie realized the enormity of his offense. Both hands flew to the towel and tore it off in confusion. The coolie bowing to the ground and offering humble apologies for having presumed to appear without uncovering his head. For in Japan, one must always uncover, whether to a sweep or to a mikado. The two parted the best of friends. One had been impolite enough to forget to uncover, the other had torn away a roof. The rudeness of the one balanced the injury of the other. Thus are the offenses weighed in Japan. End of section 122 this recording is in the public domain. Section 123 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Read for LibriVox.org by Eva Davis. How the Shopkeeper Lost His Cue by Lafcadio Hearn. An old shopkeeper who sells us lacquerware had a cue, like not a few other old shopkeepers in Kumamoto. He professed to detest all Western manners, dress, ideas, and praise the tempora antiqua without stint, whereby he offended young Japan and his business diminished. It continued to diminish. His young wife lamented and begged him to cut off his cue. He replied that he would suffer any torment rather than that. Business became slacker. Landlord came round for rent. All three were samurai. Husband was out. Landlord said, If your husband would cut off his cue, he might be able to pay his rent. That is just what I tell him, said she, but he won't listen to me. Let me talk to him, said the landlord. Q comes in, out of breath, and salutes landlord. Landlord frowns and asks for rent. Usual apologies. Then you get out of my house, says the landlord. Get out at once. Q cannot understand old friend's sudden harshness, becomes humble in vain, makes offer of his stock in payment. Landlord says, Hmm, what? 
Anything you like in the shop. Hmm. Word of honor? Yes. Landlord joyfully to wife. Bring me a scissors, quick. Scissors is brought. Dismay and protests checked by the terrible word, Yakusoku. Off goes the cue. Owner mourns. Landlord laughs and says, Old friend, I make you now a present of the three months' rent. You owe me nothing. Business begins to improve. End of section 123. This recording is in the public domain. Section 124 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Read for LibriVox.org by Avai. Fujiyama. Photograph, page 462. The Sacred Mountain of Japan is thus described by Mrs. Hugh Fraser. There is one more name besides those which I have enumerated, and to my mind it is the most poetic of all the titles of Fujisan. The Buddhists call it the Peak of the White Lotus. To them the snow-crowned mountain, rising in unsullied purity from the low hills around it, was the symbol of the White Lotus, whose foot grows green under its wide leaves in the stagnant water, while its cup of breathless white holds up its golden heart, its jewel, to the sky, and the wonderful symmetry of the mountain, with its eight-sided crater, reminded them of the eight-petaled lotus, which forms the seat of the glorified Buddha. In the more learned odes, the mountain is called Fuyo Ho, the lotus peak, and the Buddhists say that the great teacher, Buddha himself, gave it this perfect shape, the symbol of Nirvana's perfect peace. So the queen of mountains hangs between the stars of heaven and the mists of earth, dear to every heart that can be still and understand. As I said once before, Fuji dominates life here by its silent beauty. Sorrow is hushed, longing quieted, strife forgotten in its presence, and broad rivers of peace seem to flow down from that changeless home of peace, the peak of the white lotus. End of section 124. This recording is in the public domain. Section 125 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Read for LibriVox.org by Nima. The Cherry Tree of the Sixteenth Day by Lovcario Hearn. In Wakagori, a district of the province of Io, there is a very ancient and famous cherry tree called Jurokuzakura, or the cherry tree of the sixteenth day, because it blooms every year upon the sixteenth day of the first month by the old lunar calendar, and only upon that day. Thus the time of its flowering is the period of great cold, though the natural habit of a cherry tree is to wait for the spring season before venturing to blossom. But the Jurokuzakura blossoms with a life that is not, or at least, was not originally its own. There is the ghost of a man in that tree. He was a samurai of Io, and the tree grew in his garden, and it used to flower at the usual time, that is to say, about the end of March or the beginning of April. He had played under that tree when he was a child, and his parents and grandparents and ancestors had hung to its blossoming branches season after season for more than a hundred years. Bright strips of colored paper inscribed with poems of praise. He himself became very old, outliving all his children, and there was nothing in the world left for him to love except that tree. And lo! In the summer of a certain year, the tree withered and died. Exceedingly the old man sorrowed for his tree. Then kind neighbors found for him a young and beautiful cherry tree and planted it in his garden, hoping thus to comfort him. And he thanked them, 
and pretended to be glad but really his heart was full of pain for he had loved the old tree so well that nothing could have consoled him for the loss of it at last there came to him a happy thought he remembered a way by which the perishing tree might be saved it was the sixteenth of the first month alone he went into his garden and bowed down before the withered tree and spoke to it saying now dain i beseech you once more to bloom because i am going to die in your stead for it is believed that one can really give away one's life to another person or to a creature or even to a tree by the favor of the gods and thus to transfer one's life is expressed by the term migawari nai tatsu to act as a substitute then under that tree he spread a white cloth in divers coverings and sat down upon the coverings and performed harikari after the fashion of a samurai and the ghost of him went into the tree and made it blossom in that same hour and every year it still blooms on the sixteenth day of the first month in the season of snow end of section one hundred and twenty five this recording is in the public domain Section 126 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The World Story, Volume 1 china japan and the islands of the pacific edited by eva march tappan section one hundred and twenty six japanese children and their games by sir edwin arnold the children of japan charm everybody who visits the country from the highest to the lowest ranks and almost without exception they are the best behaved least mischievous most sedate demure correct amusing and unobnoxious specimens of minute humanity to be found on the globe the average american boy especially if born in well-to-do homes is an egotistic noisy restless little tyrant who makes a railway saloon or a drawing-room a place of torture to his elders the average english boy more shy and silent is yet by nature full of mischief and suppressed devilry and is too often capable of the most fiendish cruelty as for girls they are everywhere of course more docile and gentle than their brothers and seldom provoke the sensitive mind to thoughts of infanticide but the japanese babies and children boys and girls alike delight and comfort the foreign visitor by their ideal propriety the streets the houses the temples the gardens the railway lines are free and open to them for their playground is all out of doors yet they never seem to be in the way or to damage anything or to forget their good manners or break flowers and shrubs or put stones on the track they are so pre naturally and prematurely reasonable this does not imply that they are dull or indifferent or lifeless on the contrary nowhere is youth so joyous as with young japan these little ones chirp like sparrows at every corner and flit from pleasure to pleasure like butterflies in a flower garden i think such a pretty state of things is due first of all to their gentle tender dutiful mothers nowhere in this world have small boys and girls more affectionate patient devoted bringing up than the little japs get on the breasts and at the knees of their okisan and this in after years they richly return 
the reverence for father and mother being the very keystone of the national arc filial piety is next to loyalty the cardinal virtue of the land even carrying the people occasionally to an extravagant or even criminal lengths the classic picture of a good son in the japanese print shops represents a certain young man who in the season of mosquitoes stripped himself bare at bedtime and so lay down near his parents in order that the mosquitoes might feed on him and let the honored elders alone and lately there was a dreadful case in tokyo where a man actually killed his wife because he had been told that nothing short of that would bring back to health his sick mother such a deed of course shocked public opinion nearly as much in japan as it would do in england but it illustrates the force and prevalence of parental and filial dutifulness in the empire another reason why the japanese children grow up so good so charming so candid so amenable is i think because they never heard of such a thing as original sin and are never treated on the system which belongs to it by buddhist belief no doubt every little jap comes into the world with the mistakes of a previous existence to atone for and to cancel it is the doctrine of karma or ingua but parents friends neighbors and teachers leave all that to destiny and to the kamisama their part is to treat the small being as a new-come guest into the garden of life to be received with grace kindliness and consideration as a stranger and not to be bullied and browbeaten into correctness go and see jane what master reginald is doing and tell him not to do it such was the legend of one of mr du maurier's child pictures in punch but a japanese mother and a japanese child could never even have comprehended the joke they do not slap or thwart or forbid and constrain the little ones in japan although they very strictly train them to make bows and to be silent and submissive and respectful and it is a great recommendation of what may be called the anti solomonic plan that the children repay courtesy with courtesy and consideration by consideration moreover they see so much of their own world in very early days that they do not break forth like those of europe into its wonders and excitements fresh and frisky from the nursery at five or six weeks of age the japanese baby goes out into the open air lashed on the back of its mother sister aunt or nurse and there it rides all day long except as necessary intervals of refreshment taking its slumber in this peripatetic cradle and when awake seeing everything which goes on in the streets with its little slant-lidded beady black eyes so that when it comes to the point of being able to toddle for itself nothing is strange to the observant babe it owes also to that early life in the open air and perpetual motion on the back of some relation or another a large part of the generally robust health enjoyed by its kind japan is of all countries except england that wherein the fewest children die between birth and the age of five years albeit another point in favor of japanese babies is that they are nursed at the breast until they are two or even three years old in every way their world is made very pleasant to them at starting the towns and villages are full of toy shops where the most grotesque and ingenious playthings are sold for their benefit at the lowest possible cost when there happens a temple feast a matsuri or enichi 
the precincts of the holy shrine are crowded with toy stalls and the portable shops of the amiya blowing out of bean paste all sorts of sweeties shaped like to dragons snakes birds demons and the like nobody is too proud or grand to carry a baby or to be seen bearing home through the streets ridiculous creations of fluffy tigers feathery cocks and hens or balls of wool and tinsel at the great wrestling match this year in ecoin i watched a huge sumo tori the champion of his class overthrow his opponent after a tremendous struggle amid the delighted plaudits of some three thousand spectators who flung a hundred hats and caps into the ring ten minutes afterwards i met the same gigantic hero outside the wrestling theatre in the street carrying a bit of a baby on his back by the side of his little glossy-haired wife and feeding it over his brawny shoulder with salted plums the japanese children have by the way a vocabulary quite of their own just as the jinkerisha men talk their own pat toy and the court people use a special form of speech while even japanese women employ many words and phrases never heard from the lips of men one distinguishing feature of the children of japan is their sleeves after much observation and meditation in the streets and roadways of the country one arrives at last at an explanation of the extreme dignity which the little ones exhibit under almost all circumstances it is due you perceive to the long flowing sleeves which they wear nothing in respect of dress gives so much importance and presence to the human figure grown or ungrown as wide and hanging sleeves and all the little japanese when habited at all go about in tawny gowns very much resembling those worn by masters of arts and doctors of divinity at oxford and cambridge if ladies only knew how much that is graceful and imposing depends upon deep long flowing sleeves they would abandon the tight fashions of the present time and go back in this regard to the beautiful costumes which english dames wore in the days of edwards and henry's and which have been universal in japan for two thousand years a whole book might be written about the aesthetic and social value and dignity of long sleeves special days are set apart in the japanese year for the boys and girls festivals the great day of the girls is march third when all the doll shops in tokyo kyoto and the other large towns are full of what are called ohina sama models on a tiny scale of the emperor and empress with their court and domestic belongings these toy establishments are handed down from mother to daughter and i have seen high-born children playing with kina sama three hundred years old and more the special day for the boys falls on may fifth every year when the air is full everywhere of great hollow floating fish made out of colored and gilded paper which the wind inflates hoisted high upon a tall bamboo pole in front of each abode where a male child has been born the fish is the carp koi the universal emblem of courage and perseverance because he swims so stoutly against the stream and hardly consents to die when he is cut into thin slices for sashimi in early years and indeed until the age of eighteen or nineteen nothing can be too gay and brilliant for a japanese damsel to wear the little nippon maids go about far outvying in splendor the great butterflies of crimson and gold or of saffron and silver which flit around their heads in the gardens and bamboo groves parental affection seems to exalt itself in 
devising gorgeous colors and attractive patterns for their little obi and kimono while the jibon or underskirt cannot possibly be too magnificent if these garments be only of cotton the mother and father will have them gay but even the poor children generally manage to wear fabrics half of silk and half of cotton and the well-to-do always have their clothes composed of silk or the beautiful silk crepe known as cheerymen this last takes the most brilliant dyes quite perfectly and emits a very lovely decorative effects in obtaining which nothing is feared except in harmonious combinations you see young maidens in the streets and the temple gardens literally glittering with gold silver vermilion sea green sky blue rose red and orange some wearing an upper dress covered with fans birds waving woods bamboo boughs or fish and at a garden party given by the princess mori at takanawa i was presented to a young lady the lineal descendant of the great house of tokanawa shoguns whose jiban of azure silk was an embroidered pool of lotus blossoms while her kimono of tender creamy cheerman had on it japanese landscapes of rising moons rice fields fujiyama with the snow upon its crest and such like when the mature age of twenty or twenty-one is reached these dazzling glories of the toilet are exchanged for sober-hued dresses gray dove color tea color fawn and brown but even then the jibon may always be as glorious in color and patterns as fancy dictates and the obi a splendid piece of figured satin the attire of the boys is in every case quieter and more restrained and elderly people cannot be clad too soberly japanese girls grow up to be japanese women without change in their gentleness docility or good manners and japanese boys continue to appear attractive candid free from mavoy aunt and altogether delightful until they reach the awkward and gawky age which for a time spoils most lads the japanese boy is delightful the japanese man is generally intelligent polite and in his degree worthy but the japanese youth especially in the middle classes is wont to prove a hobohoi and a social nuisance as scholars and students they are almost faultless there are no rules of discipline or punishment in the schools and colleges because none are needed the pupils are too anxious to learn and are always in their places before the master is ready and keen to continue work when he is tired they are too apt to think that they know a subject when they have only commenced to understand its rudiments and although always deferential to their sensei the teacher they will dictate to him if he permits the course of study but a certain number of them mingling very imperfect modern education with very crude political theories leave their schools and colleges full of ambitions and desires which are beyond their range and instead of accepting humble and useful walks in life turn into detestable and dangerous agitators whose want of sense would be contemptible if their inherited disregard of personal risk and their passionate entitlement did not render them evils to be reckoned with those are the soshi like our own young baboos of bengal and reformers from the indian government college they have got the wind of personal and political conceit in their heads but unlike the baboos they are not in the least timid for want of other and better 
employ they hire themselves out to unscrupulous politicians as boyish swashbucklers to break up public meetings intimidate nervous statesmen dominate the voting places with noise and menace and sometimes even to commit assault or murder it was one of these unlovely youths who brooding fanatically over a supposed offence against the regalio loci of a temple at ease assassinated my enlightened and illustrious friend viscount maury and another such threw the bomb which deprived count okuma the japanese prime minister of a limb the worst of them are well known to the government and the police and when any rather exciting time is coming forward in tokyo and popular disturbance has to be feared it is not unusual for the administration to clear them out of the capital by scores or hundreds obliging them to spend a little of their ill-used leisure at yokohama or elsewhere until the temporary excitement has died away in the seat of the government the outdoor games of the japanese children are much like those of other small folks in various parts of the world though the ingenuity of the race refines upon them the taco or kite the coma or top the play ball tama the stilts takeuma the hoop taga the swing buranko the skipping rope nawa koguli prisoner's base oniko and oyama no tasko king of the castle are just as popular with many other familiar pastimes in tokyo as in london but the natural skill and adroitness of the people improve upon the western forms of these sports the kites are much more scientific than ours with long streamers at the lower corners and strange little contrivances to produce sounds explosions and illuminations in the sky japanese tops which will spin ever so long on a string or knife edge are well known and as for japanese ball play there is not a little maid of five or six years in the streets who cannot keep two or three of them in the air at once with one hand while the other holds the umbrella over the bald plate of the rocking baby some of their indoor games might be very well introduced among english children being graceful and merry yet free from boisterousness for example there is the pretty sport of suri kitsune or fox catching at which many may play at once somebody unwinds his or her silken sash and ties it in a half hitch or a reefer's knot so as to make a running noose of which two players hold the opposite ends balancing the noose vertically on the floor then any little prize a sweetmeat or what not is laid on the floor on the far side of the noose and one by one the outsiders try to snatch the object safely through the trap the two players seeking to catch the fox's paw just as it goes into the noose great fun is elicited from this and when a fox is caught he surrenders all his prizes and takes one end of the snare or this is sometimes coupled with our english game of forfeits again there is a quiet and amusing japanese form of blind man's buff mi gakushi where the fun is had with a large soft ball not hard enough to break anything or to hurt and the blind man after turning round three times throws this very suddenly in a direction as unexpected as possible any person struck being obliged to take his place another form of mi gakushi is where the blind man sits on the centre of a large circle made around him by the other players after he has had his eyes covered 
and he is then allowed to talk make jokes say anything he can to provoke a giggle or an ejaculation so that he may specify the exact position in the circle of somebody and oblige that one take his place this is called ocha boji and admits of the most charming developments end of section one hundred and twenty six this recording is in the public domain recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c section one hundred and twenty seven of china japan and the islands of the pacific read for librivox dot org by sonia islands of the pacific historical note in the early part of the seventeenth century australia was visited by the dutch and spanish and toward the end of the eighteenth century it was explored to some extent by captain cook at this time england was in search of a place to which her criminals might be sent new south wales was chosen and a penal settlement was formed great abuses were followed by reforms and explorations of the country continued in eighteen thirty seven transportation to new south wales was abolished and convicts were sent to van diemen's land now tasmania this too was given up in eighteen fifty three two years earlier gold was discovered in australia and within a year two hundred thousand seekers for the precious metal had flocked into the country in nineteen o one the commonwealth of australia was formed by the union of australia and tasmania australia and new zealand are noteworthy for the wide scope of state activity in both commonwealths the government owns and operates railways both steam and electric highways telegraph and telephone lines savings banks and loan agencies and has a system of old age pensions end of section one hundred and twenty seven this recording is in the public domain section one hundred and twenty eight of china japan and the islands of the pacific this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by son of the exiles the world story volume one china japan and the islands of the pacific edited by eva march tappan section a hundred and twenty eight the first australian colonists by w h lang in seventeen sixty eight captain james cook was sent to the south seas in command of an expedition to observe the transit of venus after this work had been accomplished he sailed about and visited the great southland or australia he touched at botany bay and tried to win the hearts of the savages he almost lost his ship and ran into the stream which is still called endeavour river to repair the damage after many other adventures he reached england in safety the result of this voyage was the colonizing of australia the following account explains how this came to pass the editor this mighty work the colonization of australia began in a very humble way until seventeen seventy five you must know that the convicted prisoners in england were transported to north america where they were employed as labourers by the colonists there in this year however the american war broke out and in seventeen eighty three the treaty was signed granting independence america could no longer be a dumping ground for our criminals and the government was looking out for some place to which they could transport this undesirable population cook's report of botany bay suggested possibilities in this direction and it was finally agreed to make the experiment on a large scale anything was better than a return to the old indiscriminate executions when a string of prisoners would be hanged before thousands of spectators every monday morning in london alone so an expedition was prepared which was to convey a little army of felons across almost unknown seas 
to the land at the very other side of the world. If you come to think of it, it was a rather grisly undertaking. There was six shiploads of convicts, three vessels full of stores for their use, an armed tender, and His Majesty's frigate Sirius. The whole expedition was under the command of Governor Arthur Phillip, a sailor, while the Sirius herself had for her captain one John Hunter. There were in all 620 male and 250 female convicts. A detachment of 208 marines was also to be shipped to keep the convicts in order, and with them 40 of their wives and a few children. What a motley crew they must have been! Some so old that they could not work, some very young. Take them as a whole, no doubt they were a shockingly bad lot. Most of them were both born and educated to crime, a few, perhaps, and God help them, innocent. With this strange company around him, Governor Philip, as commander of the fleet, hoisted his flag on the Sirius, and on the 13th of May, 1787, in the early morning, they weighed anchor from the mother bank in the Isle of Wight. Even as they sailed, a free pardon arrived for two of the prisoners, and you can imagine their feelings as they stepped on shore into England on a fine May morning, instead of sailing away across the barren seas, hopeless of any return, to a sterile and, in their eyes, a hideous land at the very ends of the earth, to be eaten, perhaps, by black savages. You may be sure every horrible possibility was magnified many times in the thoughts and talk of those first unwilling passengers to these lands. I have often, in imagination, stood on one of the ships as the fleet sailed away that morning. A fresh breeze was blowing down the channel, and although it was summer time, it was cold and bracing. There was a clear, cold horizon with sails gleaming white in the morning sun, but no smoke, as we see it now, from steamers plying to and fro. What was only just evolving the steam engine at that time? You can hear the boatswain's whistle, the clank of the capstan as the anchor was weighed, the chanty of the men as they hauled on the topsail halyards. Then each ship fluttered her white wings, the water whitened in foam at the bows, the land began to drop astern, and many had said goodbye to old England forever and a day. You can see, too, what was going on below. Before you reach the hatchway, you know that there is a seething mass of humanity in the ship's carcass. Over two hundred men, criminals, many with a life sentence, a collection of the greatest blackguards unhung. The ship is beginning to toss and to feel the uneasiness of a brisk passage in the channel. Many of these passengers have never been to sea before, and some are cursing, while others are groaning, the timbers are creaking, and the water is thumping and splashing at the bows. As I think of it all, somehow, I can always see the figure of one man. He is in convict dress, and is holding on by a hammock, peering through the little slit which serves as the only porthole to light and ventilate the space occupied by two hundred men. Here the hammocks are slung with only a foot and a half between. He has a bad face. The black hair is close-cropped, the chin clean-shaven, but the moustache, beard and whiskers are showing blue against his sallow skin. He has grey eyes set wide apart, a straight nose with delicate nostrils, upper lip long and the lower undershot, and his teeth are white and strong. The hand that steadies him is the hand of a gentleman. As he looks at the shore slipping away, the eyes for one moment soften and gleam with tears, and then with an oath and a hard laugh, they relapse into the cruel devil-may-care look, tinged with cunning when a warder or parson appears. I always see this fellow and wonder who he is. One who has had the opportunities and passed them by, no doubt. The mother who bore him would not know him now. Let us hope that she may never know his fate. As the mind travels ahead, I can see him with a dull, sulky, dazed face, taking his place beneath a beam 
from which a rope is hanging down, in the new land to which they are all travelling, and soon it is all over. A horrid subject, but true. So away sailed the first settlers, and the breeze grew to a favourable gale, and they made fair weather of it, until, in three days, they were on the broad Atlantic, and their escort, the hyena, left them, and returned to Portsmouth, with the news that all was well. But so boisterous was it that Governor Philip could write no dispatches to take home. Nor could they have transshipped it if he had written. The only ill news that the hyena brought was that a mutiny had broken out in the Scarborough among the convicts, but it had been quelled, and the ringleaders, the chief of whom was the man whom I have described to you, punished. They made a comparatively uneventful voyage of it, calling it Rio and the Cape. We should think the voyage an insufferably long one now. From May the 13th to June the 3rd, they were between the Isle of Wight and Tenerife. At this island they remained a week, watering and laying in fresh food, and here a miserable man, a convict, escaped in a small boat, but was quickly captured. Poor devil! His back smarted, you may be sure, for his last throw for liberty. Up to this time, twenty-one convicts and three children had died, and we wonder from what cause. From June the 10th to August the 6th, the fleet was sailing between Tenerife and Rio. During a similar period, we could now almost accomplish the voyage from London to Melbourne and back. They again weighed anchor on September the 4th, and had a prosperous and quite rapid passage to the Cape of Good Hope, which was reached on October the 13th. After laying in a stock of provisions and 500 head of livestock on November the 12th, they once more set sail. For 13 days they made such little headway, only 240 miles, that Governor Philip transshipped from the frigate Sirius into the tender supply, in order that he might push ahead and make preparations for landing. But from this date favourable breezes blew with such force that in forty days the land of New South Wales was sighted, and on the 10th of January, 1788, the supply cast anchor in Botany Bay. Before three days had passed, the remainder of the fleet had arrived, and they all anchored within the bay. Since embarkation at Spithead, they had lost by death on board the fleet one marine, one marine's wife and child, thirty-six male, four female convicts, and five children. On landing, an epidemic of dysentery broke out, and by June the 20th, the total deaths among the convicts had run up to 81 since leaving England, and there were 52 unfit for labour on account of old age and infirmities. One wonders how on earth old men like that were sent so far away to found a colony. But such as they were, here they were at last. Every ship of the fleet all anchored in Botany Bay, with a wonderfully clean bill of health, 252 days from Spithead. It was a fine accomplishment in those days, and Governor Philip doubtless slept sound that night when the last cable had rattled out and the last anchor had fallen with a splash into the shallow waters of Botany Bay. Botany Bay proved a disappointing place to land at. What was a fine harbour for Cook's little ship was but a poor refuge for a dozen. The country round was very bare and barren and looked swampy and unhealthy, while the water supply was limited. Philip, however, was not a man to sit still. The last of his transports had arrived on January the 20th, and by the 22nd he was off with three boats northward to find some better landing place. He had not far to go. Three leagues along the coast was a boat harbour, so marked by Captain Cook, but which the great explorer had not had time to visit. He had only seen its entrance from the Endeavour's deck while sailing past. Through the narrow heads, with their steep rocks on either hand, Philip and three boats glided on the forenoon of January the 24th. And you know now what he saw. A deep winding harbour and innumerable coves, 
or with water enough to hold quite easily the fleet awaiting it in Botany Bay. Well-wooded shores there were, and water for the drawing, birds innumerable, herbage and flowers. It was very beautiful, and to one particular cove where the water was deepest and where a little brook ran down, Philip determined to fetch his fleet and disembark his crews. For two days he explored the windings of the harbour and found no spot more favourable than this his first love. So he named it Sydney Cove, after the minister, Viscount Sydney, and in his dispatch he remarked that here a thousand ships could ride at anchor with ease. So was founded and named the town of Sydney, the eighth largest city of the empire. End of section 128. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Son of the Exiles. Section 129 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Son of the Exiles. The World's Story, Volume 1. China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 129. Gold, Gold, Gold. By W. H. Lang. Australia had been having a bad time of it in the forties, what with droughts, the low price of stock, the slow growth of population, and the fact that the market for her produce lay so very, very far away from the thickly populated countries of the old world, things were not looking very bright. And in 1849, by the merest chance, gold was found in California, and found too by a New South Wales man. He was deepening a mill race when he saw in the water glowing particles large enough to pick up with his fingers. He knew that it was gold, but he did not know how to win it, and had not an old Georgian miner been there, the discovery might even have lapsed into obscurity. Before 1849, there were only a few thousand inhabitants in the great state of California. Then all the riffraff of the old countries turned their faces to the west, and a great crowd streamed away, their eyes burning and glowing in the desire for the wealth which they believed would lie at their feet when they reached the new land. From Australia, too, a crowd rushed away to the east to join that which was rolling to the west from Europe, and our population became even thinner than it had been before. And amongst those emigrants from Sydney, was one man called Edward Hammond Hargraves. He shipped with many others in a vessel called the Elizabeth Archer and arrived in San Francisco to find the whole of the Great Bay besides the town a forest of masts. The whole world seemed to be flocking there and Hargraves joined the crowd. But if for twenty years fortune had not smiled upon him in New South Wales, neither yet did she seem to be any more kind in California. Yet, although he won no more gold than was sufficient to keep him going, he was an observant fellow, a practical geologist in a rough way, and a man of character, industrious and determined. As he worked away in the California gullies and saw the nature of the country, it began to take possession of his mind that he had seen exactly like formations in the land which he had just left, the same geological strata, and the same combination of deposits which led the experience to say, here is gold. His companions laughed at his theories, but he was deeply in earnest, and he hankered day and night to be at home again. He had arrived in San Francisco in 1849. He sailed in the bark Emma in January 1851, and, like all true Australians who think there is no country in the world like their own, was glad to be at home again. Hargraves made no secret of his theories, either on the voyage or on his arrival in Sydney, but he was laughed at as a crank. 
Gold in Australia? Pooh, pooh. The man was mad. And yet gold had already been won there. Away far back in the time of Governor Philip, a convict had produced a piece of gold which he said he had found. He could discover no more and got a flogging for his pains as an impostor and a liar. Sir Roderick Murchison, the geologist, had written papers showing that in the geological formation portions of Australia resembled the diggings in the Urals. Count Streslecki, who pioneered Gippsland, had found an auriferous iron ore, but not likely to be payable, and it was known that a man had picked up a nugget several ounces in weight on the Fish River in 1830. Then there were all sorts of rumours of how convict shepherds had made themselves rich by selling gold to the Jews in Sydney, and there was no doubt that one old fellow called McGregor from time to time took parcels of gold to the city and sold them there. Hargraves knew all these things, and he could not rest for a moment after landing in Sydney. He hired a horse and set out early in February across the Blue Mountains. It was a lonesome, desolate ride through a barren, sterile country, but after being lost once, he arrived on the fourth day at a little inn, kept by a widow woman named Lister, at Gaiyong. He was nearly in the country now which he had had in his mind's eye all through his California wanderings, and he was in a high state of excitement, you may be sure. He took Mrs. Lister into his confidence, and she, as most women would have been, was fairly bitten by the scheme and the prospects that Hargraves held out to her. When asked to find a black boy as a guide, she at once offered the services of her own son, who knew every inch of the country all around for many miles. They started away from the inn on the 12th of February in bright early autumn weather. After a dry summer, and in very few miles, Hargraves recognised the old spots on the banks of a creek. It was here that his mind had always pictured for him the discovery of untold treasures of gold. But the creek was dry at the place, and while his guide searched for water, Hargraves unwillingly sat down to take a hasty meal. Then the boy returned with the news that he had found a water hole in the creek bed. The horses were hobbled and allowed to stray away, and the grand experiment was begun. Hargraves scratched the gravel off a schistos dike, which ran across the creek at right angles, and then with a trowel he dug a panful of the earth which lay upon the rock and ran with it to the water so as to wash it in his dish. You have never washed a dish full of earth, I suppose. It is a most exciting sport, I assure you. You have a tin dish with a little rim looking inwards, and there are two or three rings running round the body of the basin. You put your spadeful of earth into this, and then, sitting on your haunches by the waterside, you dip the earth and the dish into the water and quickly wash away all the light soil. Then there is left, after some time, only the gravel, and this you gradually get rid of by swaying the basin backwards and forwards, causing the water contained in it to go round and round like a little maelstrom, until there is left only the larger, heavier portions and some heavy mineralized sand. Then you pick out the big pieces of quartzy gravel, making them to rasp pleasantly on the tin, and you throw them to one side. And as you wash, the water grows clearer and clearer, and the sand leaves a tail behind it as the water sweeps it around your dish. And then in the tail you see, gleaming, dull and warm, not glittering, but glowing rather, the unmistakable unspeakable, soul-stirring, virgin gold. So it was with Hargraves. Down there in the lonely gullies by the creek side, he washed dish after dish of soil, and in each lay the little particles, those treasures which had been hidden from the eyes of man ever since the beginning of time. It was enough to make a man lose his head, and for a moment, indeed, as he tells us himself, he did go mad. I shall be made a baronet, he called out to his guide. You will be knighted, and the old hall stuffed and put in the British Museum. And his innocent companion believed him. It is curious that Hargrave's mind 
did not seem to run on acquiring untold wealth by his discovery. I think I should have liked to go and dig and wash and wash and dig until I had acquired enough of the stuff to buy a principality and then have gone and told the authorities all about it. What do you think you would have done? But Hargraves wished to be made a baronet, of all things, and have his horse stuffed. And so what did he do? He proved about seventy miles of country to be gold-bearing, he saw ten thousand pounds raised in a week to the surface, and he called the place Ophir. Then he hastened back to Sydney, and bargained that the government should give him ten thousand pounds down as a reward for his great discovery. This was agreed to, and they also made him commissioner of the goldfields, a not very lucrative post. And with this he was contented. But, as he himself tells, had he asked for ten shillings for every hundred pounds worth of gold won for the first three years, it would not have been considered excessive. And by the bargain, he would have become the possessor of several hundred thousands of pounds. And that is the story of how gold was first found in Australia. The Australian diggings became the magnet which seemed to be attracting the whole earth. Even her own towns were deserted. Servants were not to be had at any wage. Doctors, lawyers, shoe blacks, coach builders, butchers and bakers, everybody rushed away to the diggings, eager to be rich. The newspapers were full of nothing else but gold, news sheets and advertisements. Parramatta, a suburb of Sydney, was absolutely depopulated. It was a mad time. When Hargraves had completed his bargain with government, he again started out on horseback for the fields. He found a stream of people going both ways, out to the diggings and back again. Those going out were full of hope and fire, their faces shining like those travellers in the Pilgrim's Progress who were going up to the Golden City. Those coming back were moving along slowly, sullen and sulky, beaten. It was like the two streams of fighters which eyewitnesses described as going up and down Spee and Cop in the Boer War. Those disappointed ones were vowing a terrible vengeance on him who had deceived them, as they called it. Hargraves did not tell them who he was, but at a ferry, where numbers had to wait their turn to be taken over, having first mounted his horse, he made a speech to the discontented, pointing out how and why they had failed. It was as well that he had been wise enough to mount his horse before he disclosed his name. The crowd would have lynched him. They were a motley crew, both coming and going. There was even a blind man being led by a lame one. The cripple extended his hand over his crutch, and the blind one held it, and so they went off with the best of them, all of thirst for gold. There was no difficulty in finding your way. The roads were full of passengers of every kind, on foot, on horseback, in drays and wagons, all sorts. And when you at length reached the land of promise, it was a picturesque sight. As you topped the last hill in the ranges, the mining township lay at your feet, all made of canvas tents or of wood huts. The creek on which the gold was being won wound at the feet of thickly timbered hills, and every here and there was joined by a gully from the mountains. The smoke was rising blue in the distance, and from far down beneath you arose a constant rumble and hum like distant thunder. It was the noise of the cradles. Then, as evening fell, the lights of innumerable fires began to twinkle through the darkness, the rumble of the cradles ceased, and after a while, the township slept. All over the country towns like this sprang up, and not only at the site of the first rush, but away down in Victoria, where the wealth of gold soon eclipsed that found in New South Wales. In a few months there were collected at Ballarat and Mount Alexander alone between twenty and thirty thousand men, and the total population of the colony only came to a scant two hundred thousand and it took months before the news reached the old world, and the thronging thousands began to arrive by the shipload. 
one writer at this time in reference to this distance from home says the clipper phoenician one of the most beautiful ships i ever saw reached plymouth on the third having made the unprecedentedly quick passage of eighty-three days there was no cable girdling the earth in forty seconds then and letters took eighty-three days at the quickest in transit now they are delivered punctually to the hour in thirty and the wickets as they fall in an international cricket match in london are printed in the next morning's argus in melbourne twelve thousand miles away and then the gold came pouring into the great towns on the seaboard for shipment home there were tons of it and i mean it literally when i write tons of it hargraves had washed his little spadefuls of earth in february the rush had begun in april from november the second to the thirtieth of that month the gold carried from ballarat to melbourne and geelong by the government escort alone weighed two tons and a half and this was believed to be only one-third of the whole amount raised in this district alone in one month from one locality seven tons of pure virgin native gold it was worth at the lowest three pounds ten an ounce when you look at it this way you can have but little wonder that the whole country went mad and in those days it was so easily found in many places the precious stuff simply lay on the surface in what are called nuggets there are plenty of these yet if we had eyes to see and knew where to look for them but fifty years ago these nuggets were comparatively common here for instance is the story of one particularly big find it was a few months after the first discovery had taken place at ophir in the bathurst district the first tremendous excitement had died out and then there appeared one morning in the bathurst newspaper the big headlines of bathurst gone mad again and it was little wonder a dr kerr had a station at a place called walla -Wall. he and his wife had been very kind to the blacks and they had several of them employed as shepherds and workers on the run one afternoon a black fellow who had been shepherding sheep came in and told the doctor he had found a big lump of gold far out on the place gold was of no use to him but he had heard much talk about it and knew how the white man valued the dross the doctor mounted his horse and took a hammer and a saddle-bag there it lay open to the view of any man who might pass that way no wonder if the sheep's teeth that had nibbled round it had been filled with gold at his feet the doctor saw a mass of gold and quartz which weighed over a hundred weight four thousand eight hundred and sixty pounds worth was his for the trouble of a day's ride it is told that on the journey home the doctor had a stop at some outlying house and he had no wish that the nature of the packet in his saddle-bag should be known he flung it carelessly down beside the fence as he dismounted from his horse that's heavy said the owner of the house ah my word replied the doctor it might be gold and the curious part of this discovery was that nowhere near the spot where the hundred weight had lain could any more gold be found even the earth from the vicinity when washed yielded not one grain not a tiny speck but with gold to be won by the ton and with hundreds weight lying on the surface so that you might make them your pillow as you lay back and smoked your after-dinner pipe whilst you were watching the sheep it is no wonder that the gold fever spread like the measles or influenza and that the whole community lost their heads as ship after ship came sailing in and discharged its load of immigrants the sailors used to bolt away as the anchor fell leaving their officers in despair to work their vessels as they might what wild strange times they were end of section 129 this recording is in the public domain recording by son of the exiles Section 130 
of china japan and the islands of the pacific this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jim locke of floyd virginia the world's story volume one china japan and the islands of the pacific edited by eva march tappan section one hundred and thirty the missionary and the cannibals by reginald horsley new zealand was visited by the navigators tasman and cook the island is one of the british colonial possessions and in nineteen hundred and seven it took the name of the dominion of new zealand the editor the taste which the maori had acquired for wandering outside their own country at length brought about a remarkable conjunction destined to bear most importantly upon the future of new zealand it was nothing else than the formation of a friendship between a christian englishman of singular nobility of character and a maori of sanguinary disposition a warrior notable among a race of warriors and withal a cannibal of cannibals in the first decade of the years when george the third was king there was born in yorkshire a boy who was brought up as a blacksmith for some time he followed his trade but having a strong inclination towards a missionary life he was ordained a clergyman of the church of england and in due time found himself senior chaplain of the colony of new south wales this man whose name must ever be honoured in the history of new zealand was samuel marsden who was the first to desire to bring and who did actually bring the tidings of the gospel to the land of the maori there were missionaries at work in tahiti in the marquesas and in tonga but new zealand the land of the ferocious warrior and savage cannibal had been esteemed an impossible country or at all events as not yet prepared for the sowing so it was left to itself then came a day when samuel marsden walking through the narrow streets of sydney stopped to gaze at a novel sight not far from him stalked proudly three splendid-looking men types of a race with which he was unfamiliar they were not australian aboriginals that was instantly evident their faces were strangely scarred their heads held high were plumed with rare feathers and the outer garment they wore of some soft buff material suggested the roman toga there was indeed something roman about their appearance with their fine features strong noses and sternly compressed lips mr marsden was from the first strongly attracted to these men and being informed that they were new zealand chiefs come on a visit to sydney the good man grew sad that such noble-looking men should be heathen and cannibals inexpressibly shocked him and he determined then and there that what one of god's servants might do for the salvation of that proud intellectual race that by the grace of god he would do a man so deeply religious as samuel marsden was not likely to waste time over a matter in his judgment so supremely important the chiefs readily admitted the anarchy induced by the constant friction between brown men and white though it was not to be expected that they should realize at once their own spiritual darkness mr marsden was not discouraged and set in train a scheme whereby a number of missionaries were to be sent out immediately by the church missionary society to attempt the conversion of the maori to christianity twenty-five of these reached sydney where men's ears were tingling with the awful details of the massacre of the boyd and judged the risk too great so they stayed where they were and the conversion of new zealand was delayed for a season the residence of meek and peaceable men among such intractable savages was deemed to be outside the bounds of possibility but marsden firmly believed that the way would be opened in god's good time and waited and watched and prayed possessing his soul in patience the opportunity which he so 
confidently expected arrived in eighteen fourteen some ten years after the birth of samuel marsden another boy was born on the other side of the world hongi ika was his name a chief and a chief's son of the great tribe of the naga puhi in the north marsden had swung his hammer over the glowing iron and beaten out horseshoes and ploughshares hongi too swung his hammer but it was the hammer of thor and every time that hongi's hammer fell it beat out brains and broke men's bones until none could be found to stand against him yet hongi had a hard knock or two now and then and being as yet untravelled gladly assented when his friend ruatara who had seen king george of england suggested a visit to sydney hongi found plenty to interest him and also took a philosopher's delight in arguing the great questions of religion with mr marsden in whose house he and ruatara abode marsden knew the man for what he was a warrior and a cannibal but so tactful and persuasive was he that before his visit ended hongi agreed to allow the establishment of a missionary settlement at the bay of islands and promised it his protection so the first great step was taken and marsden planted his vineyard he was a wise man and knowing by report the shortcomings of the land he desired to christianize took with him a good supply of animal food and provision for future needs as well in the shape of sheep and oxen with a view to the requirements of his lieutenants he also introduced a horse or two what impression the sight of a man on horseback made upon the maori may be gathered from the experience of mr edward wakefield twenty-seven years later at wanganui in this district which is on the opposite side of the island to that on which mr marsden landed and considerably farther south the natives had never seen a horse result they fled writes mr wakefield in all directions and as i galloped past those who were running they fairly lay down on their faces and gave themselves up for lost i dismounted and they plucked up courage to come and take a look at the curry nui or large dog can he talk said one does he like boiled potatoes said another and a third mustn't he have a blanket to lie down on at night this unbounded respect and adoration lasted all the time that i remained a dozen hands were always offering him indian corn maize and grass and sow thistles when they learned what he really did eat and a wooden bowl of water was kept constantly replenished close to him and little knots of curious observers sat round the circle of his tether rope remarking and conjecturing and disputing about the meaning and intention of every whisk of his tail or shake of his ears it was for long all endeavour and little result but other missionaries arrived new stations were erected in various parts of the north and the wesleyans seven years later imitated the example of the church missionary society and sent their contingent to the front to the fighting line these went indeed for they settled at wangaroa where the sunken hull of the boyd recalled the horror of twelve years before tara himself was still there the memory of his stripes as green as though he had but yesterday endured the poignant suffering he rendered vain for five long years the efforts of the missionaries and from his very deathbed cursed them urging his tribe to drive them out so that they fled thankful to escape with their lives for they saved naught else if mr marsden hoped to turn the philosopher warrior cannibal from the error of his ways the good man must have been grievously disappointed hongi remained a pagan but he never broke his promise to the missionary he was a terrible fellow but he was not a liar his word was sacred and he regretted on his deathbed that the men of wangaroa had been too strong for him when they drove the west missionaries from their station 
leaving mr marsden and his colleagues at rangihoa hongi returned to his trade of war and for five years or so enjoyed himself in his own way then tiring again of strife his thoughts turned once more upon foreign travel this time his ambition soared high and with a fellow-chief he sailed for london under the wing of a missionary he was exceedingly well received for the horror and fright with which the new zealanders had been regarded was greatly diminished in eighteen twenty one and britons were again looking longingly towards a country so rich in commercial possibilities so hongi found himself a lion and with the adaptability of his race so comported himself that it occurred to few to identify the bright-eyed little fellow with the ample forehead and keen brain with the lusty warrior and ferocious cannibal of whom startling tales had been told even his majesty george the fourth did not disdain to receive the napoleon of new zealand and being perhaps in a prophetic mood presented the great little man with a suit of armour hongi would have preferred a present of the offensive kind in the shape of guns and ammunition for the naga puhi had early gauged the value of such weapons in settling tribal disputes and had managed to acquire a few though not nearly enough to meet the views of hongi ika the king had set the fashion and his subjects followed suit so lavishly that if hongi had chosen to lay aside his dignity and open a curio shop he could have done so the little man was overjoyed he was rich now and he gloated over his presence as a means to an end what a war he could wage if he could only find a pretext pretext did not as a rule trouble hongi but the eyes of the great were upon him and it would be just as well to consider appearances as he recrossed the ocean his active brain was at work planning ah if he could but find a pretext hongi had been absent for two years and with right good will the tribes of the northeast wished that he might never return however with the dominant personality of the little man lacking to the all-conquering naga puhi there was no knowing what might happen so the tribes around about the thames river whose frith is that thing of beauty the haraki gulf took heart of grace marched to the fight and slew among other folk no less a person than hongi's son-in-law here was indeed a pretext hongi clung to it as a dog to his bone in sydney he had melted down so to speak his great pile of presents into three hundred stand of arms which included a goodly share of the coveted two para or double barrel guns ammunition was added and thus with a very arsenal at his command hongi ika came again to his native land he came armed cap a pie for he wore the armour which the king had given him and the good mihonari stood aghast at sight of him even now the tribes are fighting they groaned when is this bitter strife to cease pretext indeed to avenge his son-in-law was all very well utu should be exacted to the full but here was a pretext beyond all others and the wily hongi instantly seized upon it fighting are they he grinned as only a maori can grin i will stop these dogs in their worrying they shall have their fill of fighting he grinned again that will be the surest way my mihonari friends i will keep them fighting until they have no more stomach for it and so shall there be an end he muttered under his breath because their tribe shall be even as the moa as the moa was extinct the significance of the addition should be sufficiently clear hongi kept his word he always did that and sailed for the front in the proudest of his fleet of war canoes with a thousand warriors behind him armed with mare and patu and spear while in his van went a garde de corps of three hundred picked men fondling so pleased were they the three hundred muskets and to para for which their chief's presence had been exchanged southward through the 
hauraki gulf he sails into the estuary of the thames into the thames itself one halt and the totara pa is demolished and with five hundred of its defenders dead in his rear hongi sweeps on southward still to mata kitaki four to one against him what care hongi ika and his three hundred musketeers it is the same story fierce attack and sudden victory ruthless slaughter of twice a thousand foes and hongi grinning in triumph ever keeps his face to the south and drives his enemies before him as far as the lake of rotorua hongi when in battle as a rule shone resplendent in the armour which george the fourth had given him and which was supposed to render him invulnerable the belief received justification from the issue of hongi's last fight at hoki anga in eighteen twenty seven for some reason the great chief wore only his helmet upon that fatal day ill fared it then with roderick dhu when on the field his targe he threw ill fared it with hongi when he rushed into the fight without his shining breastplate for hardly was the battle joined when a bullet passed through his body and the day of the great hongi the lion of the north was done fifteen months later as he lay upon his death mats at wangaroa feasting his glazing eyes upon the array of clubs battle-axes muskets and tupars set around the bed he called to him his relatives his dearest friends and his fighting chiefs and spoke to them this word children and you who have carried my arms to victory this is my word to you i promised long ago to be kind to the mihonari and i have kept my promise it is not my fault if they have not been well treated by others do as i have done let them dwell in peace for they do no harm and some good hear ye this word also the ends of the world draw together and men of a strong race come ever over the sea to this our land let these likewise dwell in peace trade with them give them your daughters in marriage good shall come of it but if there come over the sea men in red coats who neither sow nor reap but ever carry arms in their hands beware of them their trade is war and they are paid to kill make you war upon them and drive them out otherwise evil will come of it children and you my old comrades be brave and strong in your country's cause let not the land of your ancestors pass into the hands of the pakiha white men behold i have spoken with that the mighty chief hongi drew the corner of his mat across his face and passed through the gates to the waters of ranga the abode of the shades two and twenty years from that christmas day when samuel marsden preached his first sermon in a land where christianity was not even a name four thousand maori converts knelt in the house of god the editor end of section 130 this recording is in the public domain recording by jim lock of floyd virginia section 131 of china japan and the islands of the pacific read for LibriVox.org by thomas peter hot water basins new zealand photograph page five hundred and two the scenery of some parts of new zealand is wildly beautiful there are rugged mountain chains with precipices and deep ravines there are volcanoes and hot springs and snow-covered summits there are great glaciers coming close down to the shore and long re-entrant fjords the illustration shows the famous white terraces before their destruction by a neighboring volcano in 1886. These terraces were high, wide-rippled stairways of sinter, smooth and hard. In places they swelled out as umbrella buttresses, and their floors were warm baths, into which tourists and resident Maoris delighted to plunge. Over them hung clouds of steam, and under them raged a heat that I found still strongly evident. A wild bit of the mountain scenery of New Zealand has been thus described. And now you are out among the great granite boulders upon the river's brink, 
and why what is this up the opposite bank up and still straight up your climbing eye must go following the perpendicular bush that climbs so sheer and suddenly from the riverbed up to a height of near three thousand feet and past the bush and still straight up to the belt of scant gold grass and the bare grey crags above and up 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 beyond them still with your head bent back and your senses all confounded to the glorious blue and white of a giant glacier and pure serrated snows upon the sky you are looking at one of the sides of the river valley it does not slope and it is some six thousand feet in height the other perhaps one half a mile away is equally high and just as sheer and presently as the track ascends and the trees lessen frowning white-tipped walls begin to draw together the valley becomes a canyon and you realize that you are walking in a gigantic furrow of the earth something like the lauterbrunnen thal but more stupendous and very much more beautiful end of section 131 this recording is in the public domain Section 132 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. The World Story, Volume 1, China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 132. The Story of Pitcairn Island by Anonymous In December 1787, a ship named the Bounty sailed from England for the South Seas. Her captain, William Bly, proved to be so brutal a tyrant that the mate, Fletcher Christian, and others mutinied, seized the ship, and set the captain and eighteen companions adrift in an open boat, provided with tools, food, and some few instruments of navigation this boat finally reached timor island and the men were sent to england the mutineers made their way to tahiti but fearing that an english man-of-war would be sent in pursuit of them they their native wives and friends removed to a lonely island of which they had heard called pitcairn island the editor in eighteen hundred eight the whale-ship topaz of boston captain folger chanced to be cruising near a rocky islet upon the shore of which the surf was breaking so furiously that it seemed inaccessible a canoe was seen putting off through the breakers and the occupants hailed the ship offering in good english their services if any one wished to land one of the sailors volunteered to go ashore in the canoe he soon came back with a strange report the first man whom he met on the island said his name was alexander smith and that he was the sole survivor of the crew of the bounty that including himself there were now thirty-five persons on the island captain folger then went ashore received some further information and in return told the islanders something of what had happened in the world for the last score of years how there had been a revolution in france how there was a man named bonaparte who had become emperor how there had been great wars and england had won glorious victories on the sea upon hearing this the islanders broke into a loud hurrah exclaiming old england forever captain folger returned to his ship made a note in his logbook and upon reaching valparaiso furnished an account of what he had seen which was duly forwarded to england but just then the british government had matters of more importance on hand than to attend to the case of a few people on a lonely island upon the other side of the globe so the curtain which had been lifted for a moment fell again for another six years when it was raised by accident in eighteen fourteen the frigates britain captain staines and tagus captain pippon were cruising in the pacific in search of the american sloop of war essex which had captured several british whalers as evening fell they suddenly came in sight of a small but lofty island two hundred miles from where according to their charts any island ought to have been they looked at their charts no island was there they looked to sea 
and there the island certainly was rising sheer up a thousand feet from the water's edge morning broke and there still stood the island and groups of people were standing on the rocks presently two men were seen launching a canoe into which they sprang and paddled to the ships won't you heave us a rope now was the cheery hail this was done and a tall young man of five-and-twenty sprang on board who are you was the question i am thursday october christian son of fletcher christian the mutineer by a tahitian mother and the first-born on this island the other a young man of eighteen was edward young son of another of the mutineers of whom we have spoken the young men were full of wonder at what they saw a cow astonished and perhaps frightened them a little goats and pigs were the only animals they had ever seen a little dog pleased them greatly i know that's a dog said edward i have read of such things captain staines ordered refreshments to be prepared for them in his cabin before sitting down they folded their hands and asked a blessing which they repeated at the close of the meal they had been taught to do this they said by their pastor john adams for it appears that alexander smith went also by this name which we shall hereafter give him the two captains went on shore and climbed the steep ascent to the village where the whole community headed by john adams and his blind wife were waiting to receive them he was something past fifty stout and healthy in appearance though with a careworn expression of countenance he stood hat in hand smoothing his gray locks as he had been wont sailor fashion to do a quarter of a century ago when addressing his officers on being assured that no harm should happen to him he told the story of what had occurred since the bounty disappeared the narrative runs thus for two months the bounty cruised about in search of pitcairn island when at last they discovered it the vessel was dismantled every movable article even to the planks from her sides taken ashore fire was then set to the hull and the charred remains sunk in twenty-five fathoms of water the arable part of the island was then divided into equal shares among the nine whites the tahitians being evidently considered almost as slaves christian himself apprehending that he would be followed even to his lonely retreat found a cave far up the mountainside where he kept a stock of provisions and spent much of his time gazing over the waste of waters watching for the dreaded appearance of a sail and reading a bible and prayer book for two or three years everything went on prosperously then the wife of williams was killed by falling over the rocks he undertook to take the wife of one of the tahitians whose comrades formed a plot to murder all the englishmen the plot was discovered and revealed by the wives of the whites two of the tahitians fled to the mountains where they were killed by the others to whom pardon had been offered if they would do so meantime two of the men quintal and mccoy had succeeded in distilling alcohol from a root were constantly drunk and abusive toward the natives who again determined to murder all the whites five christian mills williams martin and brown were killed on the spot smith fled severely wounded down the rocks but the tahitians promised to spare his life if he would return young was hidden by the women with whom he was a favorite quintal and mccoy fled to the mountains where they remained until summoned back peace having apparently been restored but the whites felt that their only security lay in the death of the natives they fell upon them by surprise and killed them all soon however mccoy while drunk fell over the rocks and quintal became so outrageous that adams and young killed him in self-defense these two were the sole survivors of the fifteen men who had seven years before landed upon the island how and when occurred the great change which took place in these two men is not told all that is told is that they sought out the bible and prayer book of christian and entered upon a most religious life young died of asthma in eighteen hundred not however until he had instructed adams who could barely read and not write and he the sole man on the island became the guardian and instructor of a community of more than a score of women and young children as the children grew up they were married by adams according to the form laid down in the prayer book the ring used for all having been made by him 
the son of christian took for wife the widow of edward young a woman quite old enough to be his mother and so became stepfather to the tall young man almost of his own age who accompanied him on his visit to the british ship if the islanders were astonished at the visitors the latter were no less amazed at the aspect of this little community the island apparently about a dozen miles in circuit rose to the height of a thousand feet the steep cliffs down to the water's edge being clothed with palm banyan coconut and breadfruit trees while in the valleys were plantations of taro root yams and sweet potatoes the village which consisted of five houses that being the number of families was situated on a level platform high above the ocean shaded with broad-leaved bananas and plantains the houses were of wood two stories in height each having its pig pen poultry house bakery and another for the manufacture of tapa the substitute for cloth a kind of paper made by pounding together layers of the inner bark of trees the population now numbered forty-six the young men all born on the island were finely formed tall the average height being five feet ten inches some of them exceeding six feet the young women were also tall one not the tallest was five feet ten inches all had white teeth and profuse black hair neatly dressed and ornamented with wreaths of flowers their features were of a decidedly european cast the complexion being a clear brunette their dress consisted of a loose bodice reaching from waist to knees with a sort of mantle thrown over the shoulder and reaching to the ankles which was thrown aside when at work their feet were bare the young people were then mostly unmarried for adams discouraged very early marriages as the girls would then necessarily be occupied with the care of their children and he also inculcated upon the young men the necessity of having made some provision for a family before entering into any matrimonial engagement the older women were mainly occupied in making tapa the younger worked in the fields with their fathers and brothers their strength and agility astonished their visitors one of them says captain pippon accompanied us to the boat carrying on her shoulders as a present a large basket of yams over such roads and precipices as were scarcely passable by any creatures except goats and over which we could scarcely scramble with the help of our hands yet with this load on her shoulders she skipped from rock to rock like a young roe in eighteen fifty six the whole people removed from pitcairn to norfolk a much larger and pleasanter island their love for their first home was strong however and at length a number of families returned in eighteen ninety they celebrated the one hundredth anniversary of the arrival of the bounty at pitcairn the editor end of section one hundred thirty two Section 133 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. The World's Story, Volume 1, China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 133 the last voyage of captain cook by charles c b seymour the hawaiian formerly known as the sandwich islands were discovered by captain cook in seventeen seventy eight and there the great navigator met his death in eighteen twenty american missionaries went to the islands and in twenty years the speech of the natives had been reduced to writing schools and courts of justice had been organized and the irresponsible rule of the king had been limited by a constitution in eighteen ninety three the attempts of queen lilio kalani to claim more authority than was granted by the old constitution resulted in her deposition and in eighteen ninety four a republic was established in eighteen ninety eight the islands were at their own request annexed to the united states and two years later they became a territory of that country the editor cook's third and last voyage was undertaken for the purpose 
of discovering a supposed northwest passage from the atlantic to the pacific ocean numerous expeditions had been sent out for this purpose at various times but they had all failed it was resolved by the admiralty to make one other trial under the auspices of the successful navigator accordingly on the tenth of february seventeen seventy six he was appointed to the command in his old and trusty ship the resolution and captain clerk in the discovery was ordered to accompany him cook's instructions were to proceed direct to the pacific ocean and thence to try the passage by way of bering's straits and as it was necessary that the islands in the southern ocean should be revisited cattle and sheep with other animals and all kinds of seeds were shipped for the advantage of the inhabitants the resolution sailed on the twelfth of july seventeen seventy six the discovery was to follow having on board a native of the sandwich islands to act as interpreter nothing of importance occurred on the outward voyage and on the twelfth of february seventeen seventy seven cook arrived at queen charlotte's sound new zealand where he anchored he found the natives suspiciously shy and no amount of persuasion could induce them to venture on board they had reason for their uneasiness on the last voyage the adventure had visited this place and ten of her crew had been killed in an unpremeditated skirmish they apprehended chastisement and thought it best to be on the alert it was not convenient for cook to add to any ill feeling that might exist so he said nothing about the massacre but tried to conciliate from the sound the ship proceeded to some of the south sea islands where they obtained a plentiful supply of provisions but were greatly annoyed by the thievish propensities of the natives to check this cook hit upon a new device he seized the culprit and shaved his head thus making him an object of ridicule to his countrymen and enabling the english to keep their eyes on him at tonga taboo generous hospitality was shown to them and the king invited cook to reside with him in his house here he made a distribution of animals among the chiefs explaining their uses and how to preserve them a horse and mare a bull and cow several sheep and turkeys were thus given away but in spite of this kindly reciprocity thieving still went on cook became incensed and determined that he would put a stop to it at any risk two kids and two turkey cocks were abstracted from the stores the captain seized three canoes put a guard over the chiefs and insisted that not only the kids and turkeys should be restored but also everything that had been taken away since their arrival much of the plunder was returned but the chiefs who were friendly probably felt themselves insulted after remaining nearly three months in these hospitable but unprincipled regions cook took his departure for otaheite and thence for matavai bay where he presented king otu with the remainder of his livestock among which were a horse and mare to show the natives the use of the latter animals captains cook and clerk rode about the island on horseback much to the astonishment of the simple people more civilized people have sometimes been astonished when they saw for the first time mr jack tar astride a horse the wonder of the natives never abated at huaheni a thief occasioned the voyagers much trouble he was a determined rascal and shaving his head and beard and cutting off his ears had no moral effect on him he persisted in his evil ways and defied public opinion at Ulictia, several desertions took place the deserters being sheltered by the indians both captain clerk and captain cook went in pursuit of the fugitives but without success the latter therefore ordered the chief's son daughter and son-in-law to be seized and held as hostages until the deserters were given up the remedy was effectual and in a few days an exchange was effected this severe policy of cook was intended to save the spilling of innocent blood but it produced much indignation among the savages who felt that it was an outrage to seize the highest persons in their land for every trivial offence even at this early day schemes were afoot to assassinate cook and clerk 
on the second of january the ships resumed their voyage northward they passed several islands the inhabitants of which though at an immense distance from otaheite spoke the same language those who came on board displayed the utmost astonishment at everything they saw and it was evident that they had never seen a ship before they resembled the south sea islanders in another unpleasant respect they were passionately addicted to stealing to a group of these islands captain cook gave the name of the sandwich islands new albion was made on the seventh of march the ships then being in latitude forty four degrees thirty three minutes north and after sailing along it till the twenty ninth they came to anchor in a small cove lying in latitude forty nine degrees twenty nine minutes north a brisk trade commenced with the natives who appeared to be well acquainted with the value of iron and were eager to get it in exchange for skins etc rough and manufactured into garments but the most extraordinary articles which they offered in trade were human skulls and hands not quite stripped of the flesh and which had the appearance of having been recently on the fire thieving was practised in a dexterous and educated manner but the natives were strict in being paid for everything they supplied to the ships with which rule cook was happy to comply this inlet was called king george's sound but it was afterward ascertained that the natives called it nootka sound by which name it is more commonly known from this point they exercised the greatest watchfulness hoping to find an outlet into the atlantic ocean but as every one knows without success cook was able however to ascertain the relative positions of the two continents asia and america whose extremities he observed he explored the coasts in bering straits where they found some russian traders the ships then quitted the harbour of sam Ganuda and sailed for the sandwich islands captain cook intending to await the season there and then returned to kamschatka in latitude twenty degrees fifty five minutes they discovered the island of moi and a few days later fell in with another which the natives called owahi the extent of which was so great that the voyagers were nearly seven weeks sailing around it and examining the coast the inhabitants were extremely pleasant and appeared to be entirely free from suspicion their canoes flocked around the ships in hundreds and came well laden too but the gentlemen were light-fingered and had but little fear of gunpowder captain cook had an interview with Teriobu, king of the islands in which great formality was observed on both sides followed by an exchange of presents and an exchange of names the natives were extremely deferential to cook displaying almost an amount of adoration a society of priests native furnished the ships with a plentiful supply of hogs and vegetables without requiring any return on the day previous to their departure the king sent them an immense quantity of cloth many boatloads of vegetables and a whole herd of hogs the ships then sailed but on the following day encountered such a severe storm that they had to put back in order to repair damages they anchored at the old spot and for a time things went on pleasantly but a theft took place and the seamen becoming enraged at losing every trifling article they possessed had an affray with the natives it was not a trifling article in this instance however being in fact no smaller than the cutter of the ship discovery the boats of both vessels were immediately sent in search of her and captain cook went on shore to arrange matters in a determined spirit the robbery was of the most audacious kind and certainly merited punishment but it is questionable if cook's policy considering the kindness he had so lately experienced was the best that could have been devised cook left the resolution about seven o'clock attended by the lieutenant of marines a sergeant a corporal and seven private men the pinnace's crew were likewise armed and under the command of mr roberts the launch was also ordered to assist his own boat on landing there was not the slightest symptom of hostility crowds gathered around the englishmen and were kept in order by the chiefs who seemed desirous that everything should proceed in an orderly and pleasant manner captain cook proceeded to the king's house 
and requested that he would go on board the resolution intending of course to keep him as a hostage the king individually offered but few objections but his people evidently understood the maneuver and quietly commenced arming themselves with spears clubs and daggers and protecting themselves with the thick mats which they usually donned in time of war like armor while affairs were in this state a canoe arrived from the opposite side of the bay and announced that one of the native chiefs had been killed by a shot from the discovery's boat indignant excitement now agitated the crowd the women retired and the men openly uttered threats cook perceiving the threatening aspect that things had assumed ordered lieutenant middleton to march his marines down to the boats to which the islanders offered no objection he then escorted the king attended by his wife two sons and several chiefs one of the sons had already entered the pinnace expecting his father to follow when the king's wife entreated him not to leave the shore or he would be put to death matters were now hurrying to a crisis a chief with a dagger concealed under his cloak was observed watching cook and the lieutenant of marines wanted to fire at him but this the captain would not permit the chief gained new courage by this hesitation and closed on them and the officer struck him with his firelock another native interfered and grasped the sergeant's musket and was compelled to let it go by a blow from the lieutenant cook seeing that it was useless to attempt to force the king off was about to give orders to re-embark when a man flung a stone at him which he returned by discharging small shot from the barrels of his piece the man being scarcely hurt brandished his spear as if about to hurl it at the captain who at once knocked him down but refrained from using ball he then addressed the crowd and endeavored to restore peace but while so engaged a man was observed behind a double canoe in the act of darting a spear at the captain seeing that his life was really in danger cook fired but killed the wrong man the sergeant of marines however instantly brought down the offender with his musket for a moment the islanders seemed to lose some of their impetuosity but the crowds that had gathered behind pressed on those who were the immediate spectators of what had occurred and what was even more fatal poured in a volley of stones the marines without waiting for orders returned the compliment with the general discharge of musketry which was directly succeeded by a brisk fire from the boats cook was surprised and vexed at this accidental turn of affairs and waved his hand to the boats to desist and come on shore to embark the marines the pinnace unhesitatingly obeyed but the lieutenant in the launch instead of pulling in to the assistance of his commander rowed farther off at the very moment when his services were most required the marines crowded into the pinnace with precipitation and confusion and were so jammed together that they were unable to protect themselves those who were on shore kept up the fire but the moment their pieces were discharged the islanders rushed upon them and forced the party into the water where four of them were killed and the lieutenant wounded when this occurred cook was standing alone on a rock near the shore seeing however that it was now clearly a matter of escape he hurried toward the pinnace holding his left arm round the back of his head to shield it from stones and carrying his musket in his right hand a remarkably agile warrior a relation of the king's was seen to follow him and before his object could be frustrated sprang forward upon the captain and struck him a heavy blow on the back of his head and then turned and fled cook staggered a few paces dropped his musket and fell on his hands and one knee before he could recover himself another islander rushed forward and with an iron dagger stabbed him in the neck he sank into the water and was immediately set upon by a number of savages who tried to keep him down but he succeeded in getting his head up the pinnace was within half a dozen yards of him and he cast an imploring look as if for assistance the islanders forced him down again in a deeper place but his great muscular strength enabled him to recover himself and cling to the rock he was not there for more than a moment when a brutal savage dealt him a heavy blow with a club and he fell down lifeless 
the indians then hauled his corpse upon the rock and ferociously stabbed it all over handing the dagger from one to another in order that all might participate in the sweet revenge the body was left for some time upon the rock and the islanders gave way as though afraid of the act they had committed but there was no attempt to recover it by the ship's crew and it was subsequently cut up together with the bodies of the marines and the parts distributed among the chiefs the mutilated fragments were afterward restored and committed to the deep with all the honors due to the rank of the deceased thus ingloriously perished one of england's greatest navigators whose services to science have never been surpassed by any man belonging to his profession it may almost be said says mr robert chambers that he fell a victim to his humanity for if instead of retreating before his barbarous pursuers with the view to spare their lives he had turned revengefully upon them his fate might have been very different the command of the resolution devolved on captain clerk and mr gore acted as commander of the discovery after making some further explorations among the sandwich islands the vessels visited kamchatka and bering straits there it was found impossible to accomplish the objects of the expedition and it returned southward another misfortune befell the voyagers on the twenty second of august seventeen seventy nine captain clerk died of consumption the ships visited kamchatka once more and then returned by way of china arriving in england on the fourth of october seventeen eighty after an absence of four years two months and twenty-two days when it became known in england that captain cook had perished all classes of people expressed their sympathy and deep sorrow the king granted a pension of two hundred pounds per annum to his widow and twenty-five pounds per annum to each of her children the royal society had a gold medal struck in commemoration of his services and at home and abroad honors were scattered on his memory that cook was justly entitled to these testimonials is beyond a doubt not only for the good he did his country but for his own individual merit it would be difficult to find a more brilliant instance of purely self-made greatness starting in life under circumstances of the most depressing nature he succeeded solely by the force of industry in acquiring accomplishments which gave him the foremost place among the scientific men of his age from the obscure condition of a foremost man on a collier he rose to be the greatest discoverer of modern times a recapitulation of what he accomplished may appropriately close this sketch he discovered new caledonia and norfolk island new georgia and the sandwich and many smaller islands in the pacific surveyed the society islands the friendly islands and the new hebrides determined the insularity of new zealand circumnavigated the globe in a high southern latitude so as to decide that no continent existed north of a certain parallel explored the then unknown eastern coasts of new holland for two thousand miles determined the proximity of asia to america which the discoverer of bering's straits did not perceive and wherever he went brought strange people into communication with the civilized world through the wide gates of commerce and mutual interest the rock where captain cook fell is an object of curiosity in hawaii to the present day the natives point it out with sorrow and show the stump of a coconut tree where they say he expired the upper part of this tree has been carried to england and is preserved in the museum of greenwich hospital on the remaining stump which has been carefully capped with copper is the following inscription near this spot fell captain james cook r n the renowned circumnavigator who discovered these islands a d seventeen seventy eight end of section one hundred thirty three Section number 134 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The World Story, Volume 1, China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Edited by Eva March Tepan. Section 134. The Vengeance of the Goddess Pele, a Hawaiian legend related by Kalakaua, formerly king of the Hawaiian Islands. Pele was the goddess who dwelt in the awful fires of the volcano Kilauea. She was so easily offended and so terrible in her anger that the people who lived in volcanic districts built temples in her honor and sacrificed fruit, animals, and sometimes human beings in order to win her favor or to free themselves from the fearful consequences of her wrath. The Editor The grass-thatched mansion of the young chief Calvary was near Kapuhu, where his wife lived with their two children, Pampuu and Kahui, and at Kuki, no great distance away, dwelt his old mother, then on a visit to her distinguished son. As his taro lands were large and fertile, and he had fish ponds on the seashore, he entertained with prodigality, and the people of Puna thought there was no chief like him in all Hawaii. It was at the time of the monthly festival of Lono. The day was beautiful. The trade winds were bending the leaves of the palms and scattering the spray from the breakers chasing each other over the reef. A honoa contest had been announced between the stalwart young chief and his favorite friend and companion ahua and a large concourse of men women and children had assembled at the foot of the hill to witness the exciting pastime they brought with them drums ohus ulilis rattling gourds and other musical instruments and while they awaited the coming of the contestants all frolicked as if they were children frolicked as were their way before the white man came to tell them they were nearly naked and that life was too serious a thing to be frittered away in enjoyment they ate ohias coconuts and bananas under the palms and chewed the pith of sugar cane they danced sang and laughed at the hula and other sports of the children and grew nervous with enthusiasm when their bards chanted the meles of gone years the game of hola consists in sliding down a sometimes long but always steep hill on a narrow sledge from six to twelve feet in length called a papa the light and polished runners bent upward at the front are bound quite closely together with crossbars for the hands and feet with a run at the top of the sliding track slightly smoothed and sometimes strewn with rushes the rider throws himself face downward on the narrow papa and dashes headlong down the hill as the sledge is no more than six or eight inches in width with more than as many feet in length one of the principal difficulties of the descent is in keeping it under the rider the other of course is in guiding it but long practice is required to master the subtleties of either kahavari was an adept with the papa and so was ahua rare sport was therefore expected and the people of the neighborhood assembled almost in a body to witness it Finally appearing at the foot of the hill, Kahavari and his companions were heartily cheered by their good-natured auditors. Their papas were carried by attendants. The chief smiled upon the assemblage, and as he struck his tall spear into the ground and divested his broad shoulders of the kihi covering them, the wagers of fruit and pigs were three to one that he would reach the bottom first 
although ahua was expert with the papa and but a month before had beaten the champion of kau on his own ground taking their sledges under their arms the contestants laughingly mounted the hill with firm strong strides neither thinking of resting till the top was gained stopping for a moment preparatory to the descent a calmly-looking woman stepped out from behind a clump of undergrowth and bowed before them little attention was paid to her until she approached still nearer and boldly challenged kahavari to contest the hula with her instead of ahua exchanging a smile of amusement with his companion the chief scanned the lithe and shapely figure of the woman for a moment and then exclaimed more in astonishment than in anger what with a woman and why not with a woman if she is your superior and you lack not the courage was the calm rejoinder you are bold woman returned the chief with something of a frown what know you of the papa enough to reach the bottom of the hill in front of the chief of puna was the prompt and defiant answer is it so indeed then take the papa and we will see said kahavari with an angry look which did not seem to disturb the woman in the least at a motion from the chief ahua handed his papa to the woman and the next moment kahavari with the strange contestants closely behind him was dashing down the hill on on they went around and over rocks at breakneck speed but for a moment the woman lost her balance and kahavari reached the end of the course a dozen paces in advance music and shouting followed the victory of the chief and scowling upon his excellent multitude the woman pointed to the hill silently challenging the victor to another trial they mounted the hill without a word and turned for another start stop said the woman while a strange light flashed in her eyes your papa is better than mine if you would act fairly let us now exchange why should i exchange replied the chief hastily you are neither my wife nor my sister and i know you not come and presuming the woman was following him kahavari made a spring and dashed down the hill on his papa with this the woman stamped her foot and a river of burning lava burst from the hill and began to pour down into the valley beneath reaching the bottom kahavari rose and looked behind him and to his horror saw a wide and wild torment of lava rushing down the hillside toward the spot where he was standing and riding on the crest of the foremost wave was the woman now no longer disguised but pele the dreadful goddess of kilauea with thunder at her feet and lightning playing with her flaming tresses seizing his spear kalavari accompanied by ahuna fled for his life to the small eminence of pukea he looked behind and saw the entire assemblage of spectators engulfed in a sea of fire with terrible rapidity the valleys began to fill and he knew that his only hope of escape was in reaching the ocean for it was manifest that pele was intent upon his destruction he fled to his house and passing it without stopping said farewell to his mother wife and children and to his favorite hog aliopua telling them that pele was in pursuit of him with a river of fire and to save themselves if possible by escaping to the hills he left them to their fate coming to a chasm he saw pele pouring lava down it to cut off his retreat he crossed on his spear pulling his friend over after him at length closely pursued he reached the ocean his brother discovering the danger had just landed from his fishing canoe 
and had gone to look after the safety of his family kavari leaped into the canoe with his companions and using his spear for a paddle was soon beyond the reach of the pursuing lava enraged at his escape pele ran some distance into the water and hurled after him huge stones that hissed as they struck the waves until an east wind sprang up and carried him far out to sea he first reached the island of maui and thence by the way of lanai found his way to oahu where he remained to the end of his days all his relatives in puna perished with hundreds of others in the neighborhood of kapoho but he never ventured back to puna the grave of his hopes and his people for he believed pele the unforgiving would visit the place with another horror if he did pele had come down from kilauea in a pleasant mood to witness the hola contest but kahavari angered her unwittingly and what followed has just been described end of section 134 this recording is in the public domain section number 135 of china japan and the islands of the pacific this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c the world story volume one china japan and the islands of the pacific edited by eva march tappan section one hundred and thirty five father damien the missionary to the lepers by john c lambert he was born in eighteen forty of peasant parents at a little village on the river lac not far from the ancient city of louvain in belgium his real name was joseph de Wuster, damien being a new name which he adopted according to the custom of the religious orders when he was admitted to the congregation of the picpus fathers in eighteen sixty four he joined on the shortest notice as a substitute for his elder brother who had suddenly fallen ill a band of missionaries for the hawaiian islands and his life's labors were begun in the very island on which captain cook met his tragic end so long before here for nine years he toiled unsparingly endearing himself to the natives and earning from his bishop the title of the intrepid because nothing ever seemed to daunt him he had many adventures both on the sea and among the volcanic mountains for like bishop huntington whom he frequently recalls he was a bold cliff climber and a strong swimmer in visiting the people in the remoter parts of the island he thought nothing of scaling precipitous rocks on hands and knees till his boots were torn to shreds and the blood flowed freely from feet as well as hands once when his canoe capsized he had to save his life by a long swim in his clothes on another occasion as he was riding along a lonely coast he observed a ship's boat with several persons in it drifting helplessly towards the rocks jumping from his horse he plunged into the sea and succeeded in reaching the boat and bringing to land eight shipwrecked sailors three americans four englishmen and a dutchman their vessel had taken fire in mid-ocean for more than a week they had drifted about in the pacific till their strength was utterly exhausted and death was already staring them in the eyes when the brave young priest came with deliverance but we must pass from deeds of courage and daring in which damien had 
been equalled by many others, to speak of the great deed of sacrifice in which he stands alone. The lovely Hawaiian islands have long suffered from terrible scourge, the scourge of leprosy. Some years after Father Damien's arrival, the government determined on the use of drastic measures to stamp out the evil. There is in the archipelago an island called Molokai, which along its northern side presents to the sea an awful front of a precipice. At one spot, however, in this frowning battlement of rock, and bearing to it, in R. L. Stevenson's vivid comparison, the same relation as a bracket to a wall, there projects into the ocean a rugged triangular piece of land known as Kalawao, which is thus cut off between the surf and the precipice. To this desolate tongue of wind-swept down it was resolved to deport every person, young or old, rich or poor, prince or commoner, in whom the slightest taint of leprosy should be found. The law was carried into effect with the utmost rigor. All over the islands, lepers and those suspected of having leprosy were hunted out by the police, dragged away from their homes, and if certified by a doctor as touched by the disease, at once shipped off to the leper settlement, as if to a state prison. Children were torn from their parents and parents from their children. Husbands and wives were separated forever. In no case was any respect of persons shown. And a near relative of the Hawaiian queen was among the first to be seized and transported. Awful indeed was the lot of these poor creatures. Thus gathered together from all parts of the islands and shot out like rubbish on that dismal wedge of land between cliff and sea parted for ever from their friends outcasts of society with no man to care for their bodies or their souls with nothing to hope for but a horrible unpitied death they gave themselves up to a life like that of the beasts of the field and even to this day things might have been no better on the peninsula of Kalawao had it not been for the coming of Father Damien. For some time Damien had felt the dreadful lot of these unfortunates pressing heavily upon his heart, all the more as several of his own flock had been carried away to the settlement. In a letter written about this time, he says that when he saw his own beloved people dragged away, he felt a presentment that he should see them again. Such a presentment could only point to one thing. From Molokai, no leper was ever permitted to return. Above the beach of Kalawao, as above the arc portal of Dante's Inferno, the awful words might have stood abandon hope all ye who enter here if father damien was to see his poor smitten children again it must be by going to them for never more should they return to him one day there was a gathering of the roman catholic clergy at the dedication of a church on the island of maui which lies not far from molokai after the ceremony was over, the bishop was holding a familiar conversation with his missionaries, and in the course of it he spoke of the distress he felt for the poor lepers of Molokai, stricken sheep without a shepherd. At once Damien spoke out. My lord, he said, on the day when I was admitted to the order of the Picpus fathers, I was placed under the pall, that I might learn that voluntary death is the beginning of a new life, and I wish to declare now that I am ready to bury myself alive among the lepers of Molokai, some of whom are well known to me. It shows the stuff of which those Roman Catholic missionaries were made that the bishop accepted Damien's proposal 
as simply and readily as it was uttered i could not have imposed this task upon any one he said but i gladly accept the offer you have made at once damien was ready to start for like general gordon when he started for khartoum he required no time for preparations a few days afterwards on may eleventh eighteen seventy three he was landed on the beach of kalaweo along with a batch of fifty miserable lepers whom the authorities had just collected from various parts of hawaii the sights that met the eye of the devoted missionary must have been revolting beyond expression though damien says little about them for it was not his habit to dwell on these details stevenson visited molokai after damien was dead and after the place had been purged bettered beautified by his influence and example but he describes the experience as grinding and harrowing the princess regent of hawaii once paid a state visit to the settlement while damien was there and after his presence had wrought a marvellous transformation the lepers were dressed in their best triumphal arches adorned the beach flowers were strewn in profusion along the path that led to the place of reception but when the royal lady looked around her on that awful crowd the tears rolled down her cheeks and though it had been arranged that she should speak to the people her lips trembled so helplessly that she was unable to utter a single word damien came to kalaweo when the settlement was at its worst he saw it too not as a passing visitor but as one who knew that henceforth this was to be his only home on earth he confesses that for a moment as he stepped ashore his heart sank within him but he said to himself now joseph my boy this is your life work and never during the sixteen years that followed did he go back upon his resolve for several weeks until he found time to build himself a hut he had no shelter but a large pandanus tree this pandanus tree he called his house and under its branches he lay down on the ground to sleep at night meanwhile from the very first he spent his days in trying to teach and help and comfort his leper flock in a letter to his brother father pamphile in substitution for whom as mentioned already he had become a hawaiian missionary he admits that at first he almost grew sick in the presence of so much physical corruption on sundays especially when the people crowded closely round him in the little building which served as a chapel he often felt as if he must rush out of the lonesome atmosphere into the open air but he deliberately crushed these sensations down he sought to make himself as one of the lepers and carried this so far that in his preaching he did not use the conventional my brethren but employed the expression we lepers instead and by and by the spirit of sympathy grew so strong that even in the presence of what was most disgusting all feeling of repugnance passed entirely away it was not only the souls of the lepers for which father damien cared at the time there was no doctor in the settlement so he set himself to soothe their bodily sufferings as best he could cleansing their open wounds and binding up their stumps and sores death was constantly busy indeed some one died almost every day and whether at noon or at midnight the good father was there to perform the last offices of his church and as he sought to comfort the lepers in dying his care for them continued after they were dead before his arrival no one had thought of burying a dead leper with any sort of decency no coffin was provided 
the corpse at best was shoveled hastily into a shallow hole but father damien's reverence for a human being forbade him to acquiesce in such arrangements as there was no one else to make coffins he made them himself and it is estimated that during his years on molokai he made not less than fifteen hundred with his own hands more than this when no other could be got to dig a proper grave damien did not hesitate to seize his spade and act the part of the grave digger to most people such toils as pastor and teacher doctor and undertaker would seem more than enough for even the strongest of men but they were far from summing up the labors of damien he induced the people to build themselves houses and as few of them knew how to begin he became head mason and carpenter-in-chief to the whole settlement he next got them to give him their assistance in erecting suitable chapels at different points of the peninsula he built two orphanages one for boys and one for girls into which he gathered all the fatherless and motherless children and to the instruction of these young people he gave special attention above all he sought by constant cheerfulness and unflagging energy to infuse a new spirit into that forlorn collection of doomed men and women by teaching them to work he bought a fresh and healthy interest into their lives by creating a christian public opinion he lifted them out of the condition of filth and sottishness into which they had sunk but above all he wiped off from their souls the soiling of despair by assurance he gave them of human sympathy and divine love what was father damien like many will ask he was tall and strong indeed an imposing presence with a bright and serene countenance and a rich and powerful voice the very sight of him brought strength and comfort to others like the master whom he loved and sought to follow and who also was the friend of the leper he was possessed of a strange magnetism a kind of vital virtue which though in damien's case it could not effect miracles yet had power to lift up the hearts of those who were bowed down by their infirmities so the years passed on while day after day was filled up with such tasks as we have described during the first six months the father was sometimes haunted by the thought that he had contracted the insidious disease but thereafter he banished the idea from his mind and lived on in molokai for many years in perfect health and strength one day however as he was washing his feet in unusually hot water he noticed that they had been blistered with the heat without his being conscious of any pain at once he knew what this meant he had not lived so long in the settlement without learning that the absence of feeling in any part of the body is one of the surest symptoms of leprosy and now he understood that his doom was sealed but the fact made very little difference in either his thoughts or his ways so long as he was able he went on with his duties as before while he exerted himself with special anxiety to secure that after he was gone the work he had been doing in the settlement should be carried on and carried on still more efficiently than had been possible for one who labored single-handed and before he died he had the joy of knowing not only that these deeds of love and mercy would be taken up and continued by other fathers of his order but that a band of franciscan sisters inspired by his great example had volunteered to serve as nurses among the lepers of molokai and that an adequate hospital with a thoroughly qualified doctor 
would seek to assuage the sufferings of those who had reached the last stages of the fatal malady in spite of all that father damien accomplished when he was alive we might almost say that he did more for the hawaiian leopards by his death than by his life it was not till after he had passed away that men came to a full knowledge of this hero of the nineteenth century largely by the help of the burning pen of robert louis stevenson the story of his willing martyrdom flew round the world and made the name of molokai illustrious international sympathy was aroused for the poor sufferers for whom damien laid down his life the press of every christian country resounded with his fame princes and peasants sought to do him honour his royal highness the prince of wales afterwards edward the seventh placed himself at the head of a movement which had for its object to commemorate the life and labours of this brave soldier saint of jesus christ money flowed in by which it became possible to do much more for damien's leper flock than he had ever been able to do himself the damien institute was formed in england for the training of roman catholic youths to the laborious life of missionary priests in the south seas when father damien's end was drawing near he expressed a desire to be buried at the foot of the pandeus tree beneath which he had lived when he first came to molokai the two fathers who were now with him thought it right to comply with his wishes and so under the very spot which once served him for his bed his body lies awaiting the resurrection with flowers growing over it and the wide tree spreading above in one of the streets of louvain there stands a beautiful statue of father damien his face is uplifted to heaven his left hand holds a crucifix to his heart his right arm is thrown in love and protection round the shoulder of a poor leper who crouches to his side for comfort it is a fine conception finely executed and yet its effect upon the beholder can hardly compare with the feelings of those who like stevenson and other pilgrims to the island have stood by that grave in molokai beneath the old pandeus tree and seen father damien's monument lying all around him in that community of leopards which has been purged bettered beautified by his great act of sacrifice end of section 135 this recording is in the public domain Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section 136 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simon Nix. The World Story, Volume 1, China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific, edited by Eva March Tapan, Section 136. A Visit to Aguinaldo by Edwin Wildman. The Philippines were visited by Magellan in 1521. Half a century later, the Spanish took possession of them and named them in honor of Philip II of Spain. In 1896, the natives, led by Aguinaldo, revolted against Spanish rule. After the Spanish-American War, Aguinaldo fought against the United States, into whose hands the islands had now fallen. In 1901, he was captured, and American rule was established throughout the Philippines. The Editor In November 1898, I visited Aguinaldo at his capital at Malelos. I was laboring under the popular delusion as to Aguinaldo's greatness, and judged him largely from the documents that bore his name. Although I was in possession of some information which aided me in understanding somewhat the situation at Malelos, I was well acquainted with a number of revolutionary sympathizers and several members of Aguinaldo's cabinet who resided in Manila. 
and considering their views and the positions they held, I was somewhat surprised at the open manner in which they depreciated Aguinaldo's ability and deplored the prominence accorded him, even while they themselves admitted that his name was the only one that held the natives in check and united in the aspirations for independence. It was humiliating to them that Aguinaldo, instead of one of their number, held the confidence of the people. I shall not soon forget my pilgrimage to the Filipino Mecca. Those were the palmy days of the Republica of Filipina, and Aguinaldo's name was on every lip. There was a cordon of insurgent soldiers around Manila, and to pass this line one must needs have a pass signed by Aguinaldo. I boarded the diminutive train on the Manila Dagupan Railroad, and in company with twelve carloads of barefooted natives, was soon speeding along the little narrow gauge toward Malelos. In half an hour we had passed the cordon, and I and my Filipino companion were landed on the Malelos platform, which was patrolled by a half dozen or more Filipino soldiers, who strutted up and down and, it seemed to me, looked upon me with suspicion. I greeted their looks with an affable smile, we all did then, and they withdrew their stare and passed on. After the little train puffed out of the station, I pushed my way through a crowd of palm-extended beggars, trading upon deformed limbs and leprous faces, and reached the opposite side of the station, where lingered beneath the shade of some scraggly palms a half-dozen carometas attached by crude hemp harnesses to ponies, long strangers to Sakati and Pali. Though naturally merciful to the animal kingdom, I was prevailed upon by Malelo's hackmen, augmented by the persuasive rays of the midday sun, to take a seat in one of their crude carts, and was soon bumping and joggling over the occasionally planked road toward the Pueblo. It was tiffin time, and I knew better than to disturb any Filipino gentleman at midday, for a siesta follows tiffin with as much regularity as a demi tassi does dinner in America. My Filipino friend and myself therefore repaired to a public house and partook of a native meal, which was washed down by native drinks, the combination fitting one for any crime. After visiting the church, the public square, and the town pump, I presented myself at the Casa Aguinaldo. The Presidente made his headquarters in the second story of a large convent, or priest's house as it is called, adjoining the Malelos Church, which was utilized to accommodate the sessions of the Filipino Congress. Two Maxim guns protruded from the windows of the convent, and the entrance was guarded by a patrol of Filipino soldiery. We passed this gauntlet without challenge and ascended the convent stairs. At the top extended a long, broad hall. On either side of this passageway were stationed Aguinaldo's bodyguards armed with halberds. Diminutive Filipinos, almost comical in their toy-like dignity, were ranged along the wall, giving themselves an extra brace as we passed. The halberds were cheap imitations of those customarily used in the palace of the Governor-General at Manila upon state occasions. Our cards were sent in. The Presidente would receive us. Would we wait for a brief space? The dapper but brave little insurgent general, Pio del Pinar, was pleased to greet us. The Presidente knew of my coming, had it not been telegraphed to him when we crossed the line. Ah, Signor, the Presidente knows everything. He desires to protect Americans when they do him so much honor. But did one need special protection in Aguinaldo's country? No, Signor, but there are Spaniards who yet hope and hate. Too much caution cannot be exercised. Would we look at the council room? and so on. I early learned that if one wished to get information from a Filipino, one must not ask it. Aguinaldo's council chamber was interesting. Down the center of the hall were parallel rows of chairs, Filipino style, facing each other. Here sat the dignitaries of state like rows of men awaiting their turns in a barber shop. The walls were hung with creditable paintings by native artists. A large oriental rug covered the mahogany floor. On bamboo pedestals around the rooms were miniature wood carvings representing Filipino victims undergoing tortures of various descriptions at the hands of friars and Spanish officials for refusing to divulge the secrets of the Katapunan. One showed a native suspended on tiptoes by a cord tied around his tongue, while a Spanish hireling slashed his back with a knife. Another represented a native of the province of Nueva Ecija, falsely accused of hostility to the Spanish, so I was told. A cord passed through his nose, as if he were a beast of burden. A Spaniard was cudgeling his bare shoulders with a bamboo stick. Another showed a Filipino hung up by his feet with a big stone bound to each shoulder. 
still another represented a native with his back bent backwards, a pole passing under his knees, a cord around his chest holding him bent over in a most painful position, and others equally terrible. All these were actual cases. I was told the history of each one. Finally, Aguinaldo was ready to receive us. The red plush curtains that separated his private room from the council chamber were drawn aside by guards, and we entered the Holy of Holies. The little chieftain was already standing to receive us. His spacious room was adorned with Japanese tapestries. Around the walls were handsome Japanese vases, and emblazoned high on one side of the room was a shield of ancient Japanese and Mindanao arms. On another side of the room was a huge Spanish mirror. Back of Aguinaldo's desk hung from its staff a handsome Spanish flag. I jokingly asked Aguinaldo if he would present it to me as a souvenir of my visit. Not for twenty-five thousand pesos, he replied. I captured it at Cavate, my native town. The Spaniards have offered thousands of pesos as a bribe for the restoration of that flag. So I keep it here. Aguinaldo is short. His skin is dark. His head is large but well poised on a rather slight body. His hair is the shiny black of the Tagalog and his combed pompadour, enhancing his height somewhat. On that day he was dressed in a suit of fine piña cloth of native manufacture, and he wore no indication of his rank. Through my Filipino friend as interpreter, I had an extended conversation with him. He told me that he hoped to avoid a rupture with the Americans, but that his people felt that they had been wronged and slighted, and that they were becoming turbulent and difficult to control. He said that his government was thoroughly organized, that throughout the provinces, where insurrection had been incessant for years, all was quiet, and the peaceful pursuits of labor were being carried on. I hope these conditions will not be disturbed, he added, not without meaning. I asked him if the charges were true that the Spanish friars were maltreated, and if women also were imprisoned. He replied that he was not responsible to anyone for the treatment of his prisoners, but that if an accredited emissary of General Otis would call upon him, he would permit him to visit the places where the Spanish prisoners were confined. As to the women, he said that they were wives of the priests, and voluntarily shared captivity with them. As I left the room, he spoke to my Filipino friend, calling him back. Being somewhat curious at this not altogether polite act, I later asked the reason. My friend smiled and told me that Aguinaldo wished to make a purchase in Manila, and requested him to attend to it. But what did he want, I said. My friend again smiled and said, You know he is vain. He wants me to get him another large mirror like the one in his room. He desires it to be the finest plate glass and the frame also, Spanish style, to be set with mirrors. He wants, too, some other decorations and knick-knacks for his room. He is fond of finery, like the rest of us, you know. I saw that great French plate glass mirror several months later. It was removed from the Aguinaldo Sanctum, however, and braced up against a mango tree in front of the palace headquarters. A big, swarthy Kansan was taking his first shave before it after the capture of Malelos, March 31st, 1899. End of section 136. This recording is in the public domain. Section 137 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Locke of Floyd, Virginia. The World's Story, Volume 1 china japan and the islands of the pacific edited by eva march tappan section one hundred and thirty seven preparing our moros for government by r l bullard a curious and interesting process has been going on in mindanao of the philippines the west is being grafted upon the east american government and ways are passing to oriental savages the most troublesome and inaccessible tribe were the lanao moros living about the fine lake of that name high in the mountains and forests of the interior of mindanao 
from thence in the past they had sallied forth when they pleased in piratical and slave-taking expeditions that made the name of moro the terror of the philippines returning thither their ways had seemed to close behind them it was for the americans to open these ways for here as perhaps over all the earth road-making was to be the first step and to merge with government-making and civilization for the milanaos as these moros called themselves the two began together united states troops began laboriously to open a road from the north shores of mindanao to the borders of lake lanao the work fell to the soldier for with the coming of civil government to the other philippines the moros because of their long tradition of piracy lawlessness and savagery had been left to the care of the army from this work from his part and charge thereof and from his subsequent experience as first governor of lanao the writer speaks having heard only fearful rumours of the military prowess and dire fanaticism of the moros we came to find a numerous people in a native state of political chaos to the civilised mind incomprehensible for reasonable beings incredible nothing not even pandemonium could be said to reign in such disorder an infinity of chiefs called datos with pompous titles sultan and raja suggesting power and authority yet having none divided a fine country into many minute sovereign and independent followings of uncertain jurisdiction as to persons places and things there were five tribes which however differed only in name not in condition or characteristics these tribes had their traditional hereditary sultans doubled and trebled perhaps but always largely nominal and except for their immediate personal following with but little real authority over their sons the general people and the countless lesser dattos and sultans of the tribe they had influence hardly control the latter governed themselves that is lived as they pleased as they could or as they were allowed by their neighbours more probably than any other man on earth the moro did as he pleased his only restraint was his fear of others with perhaps a dozen separate dato groups within a radius of a mile with no common superior to adjust differences followers of different dattos wrangled lay in wait for one another made war or watched one another in a state of armed peace that was worse than war with no other means of squaring accounts than by war and aggression these were continual rivalry and jealousy were the predominant tones fear on the datto's part that if he were severe with his followers they would leave him and by joining some neighbours disturb the local balance of power prevented the punishment of any but domestic offences and so moros everywhere were thieves robbers pirates and slave-takers in a state of continual violence and wrong-doing toward one another and all men so far as they dared they loved markets trade and intercourse but for these there was no protection except individual prowess if wives or children went out without guard but a little way from home they were likely to be nabbed and run off into slavery by prowling man-hunters shifted about so quickly from hand to hand and lost beyond all power of tracing they showed signs of industry but for this virtue savagery offers no encouragement trained in the use of the dagger crease two-handed sword and spear all moros were soldiers proud quick-tempered quarrelsome ever on the look out for opportunity to try their skill in arms without which waking or sleeping they were never caught such were the moros there was no government the only suggestion of it was found in the datto manifestly here not only had the foundations of government and order yet to be laid but the very places for them were to be made and prepared from a few fights that had preceded our coming 
it had been made plain to the american authorities that with our superior intelligence arms and organization we could whenever desired absolutely wipe the moros off the earth there was however in such proceeding neither purpose nor glory and the policy was to grant opportunity to the moros if they would take it for better things in peace thence logically my first steps were to try to demonstrate to them our good intentions to place on exhibition before them the advantages the benefits of peace order and government things which they had not beginning then the labour of soldiers slowly and painfully for four months worked a road through jungle forest and mountain toward the heart of the moro country in this time though often invited and always treated with great consideration but a few straggling moros came to visit me with these however i spent time patiently squatting or sitting about camp sometimes talking often in silence all day to the very night so long as they would stay to allow them to look and learn to observe us for themselves and satisfy their curiosity then as they went away i invited them to come again to-morrow they came in little bunches and the dattos talked they rarely spoke directly upon the subject which nevertheless i could see was uppermost in their thoughts our coming they either disdained any show of interest in it that might imply concern or fear about our presence for a moro is nothing if not proud or else preferred to draw their own conclusions from time and observation in the outset of trying to establish friendly relations ill luck befell simultaneously with the americans there appeared amongst the moros the most fearful of all diseases the asiatic cholera and straightway it was charged upon us the white men were in league with the cholera man and had brought his devils to destroy the moros my few friends dropped away out of sight whence they had come prowling bands even lone moros beset the trails in camp lying in wait and attacking with fury and bitterness lone sentinels and small parties a single old dato allen dug stayed from his sea-coast village he had looked wider upon the world and was wiser than his fellows i did not need to tell him for he easily saw for himself our mortal terror of the cholera whose cause we call germs he devils he did not however understand why we were not dying like the moros i showed him the soldiers boiling their water and told him that before drinking we thus drove the cholera forth from the water in which it lived to my surprise he never flinched at the statement he swallowed it whole this truth so hard of acceptance among wiser men found ready belief with this savage long afterward i knew why it agreed with the moro religious theory that all diseases are but devils that have slipped from the outside into the body our theory and theirs so different yet the same proved a first bond something common between white man and brown allen dug told the other moros what a just theory the americans had of the cholera and how the awful disease had killed but few americans in a short time my friends began to come back with him bringing all the ills of human flesh for cure by advice of the white man in whose medical theories they had quickly acquired confidence thenceforward medicine and especially quinine became my ally esteemed above right reason principle and upon occasions even above force the labour of building a great road through mountain and tropical forest was slow we were still after months far from the moro country not among the people we had come to reach a weekly market at a coast settlement and the season of salt boiling were however bringing parties of moros from the far interior past us to the coast curiosity induced them to squat talk and smoke with me while they sized up 
the americans and admired their beautiful arms thus daily i spent hours with them the first thing ever in their eyes and thoughts was arms firearms but on this subject i would not talk they were greatly impressed with the quantity and variety of the things we had here i was ready for them the moros were very poor they said they relied upon arms and the religion of the prophet their sultans and dattos were mighty and were not subject to or ruled over by one another or by any man because they were brave feared not death and their mountains covered them i told them of the might but assured them of the friendly intentions of the americans that we had not come to fight but to open roads so that the moros could come to buy sell trade work with the americans and grow rich that we had come to bring the moros all the valuable and useful things which they saw we had i ended with an offer to hire and pay them for working on the road thereat they professed much pleasure in this my thoughts were on work for peace theirs on arms for war firearms which in the morrow i shut out sight and consideration of all things else moved by the hope of getting these some smaller dattos near after much talk declared themselves ready to accept the offer of work old allen dug came first with a handful of ugly-looking followers whom we treated like kings and handled like infernal machines ready to go off at any time when at the end of the day they received their pay their thoughts turned upon the coin the money in hand in a sort of charmed pleased surprise the next day saw their numbers grow succeeding days new groups were added with growing confidence but armed always armed stuck all over with daggers and crises a few days work however and my old friend allen dug fell from me for a while on the arms question a stray moro a low-bred common fellow taking advantage of the dado's absence at work with me had eloped at one fell swoop with two of the dato's young wives the dato must have revenge and to obtain it rifles from me his brother who had come to do the moro's good disappointed at my refusal he went away sulking but as i had expected his people in a day or two sneaked back to work without him to get from the americans the sure pay and regular food which made them forget their dato's anger it was an augury of good which as time passed i was to see more and more realized the market-goers and salt-makers carried the news of the money-getting to the interior and other strangers appeared strengthening the number of our labourers and friends and weakening the ranks of the hesitating or hostile pay for work was sure and the burning desire for arms began to be forgotten in an awakened love of gain a new force was at work among moros and what in civilized men we rail at as low and vile became in these savages a saving virtue making for peace and progress the followers of the dato alag and the men of puguan who on account of a damsel bought and paid for but never delivered had for years been attacking one another on sight and dared not now as they loved their lives meet on market or trail wipe the score from memory to come and earn money together on the american road the sultan of balet and the sultan of momungan next-door neighbours who in a way to rack the nerve and wreck the best men ever built had long been either at war or in a state of continual guard night and day against each other's raids forgot the old cannon that had been the cause of the trouble and came to work on the road without friction men to whom it had been discredit if not dishonour to be found without arms gradually came to lay them aside at the white man's insistence for a short time at least while they laboured harder still for a moro whose law is an eye for an eye 
conduct for conduct to all generations a dato a favourite of mine under the same influence came after six months to look if not with forgiveness at least without excitement and feverish desire to kill upon a moro road labourer of mine some of whose people in long gone times had fought and wounded the dato's grandfather a boyhood spent among simple ignorant plantation negroes later experience as officer over them and others like them the filipinos had strongly impressed upon me the distrust which such people always feel toward middlemen of all kinds especially interpreters direct speech alone satisfies them with the moros the constant effort and practice of our all-day seances had in a few months obviated alike the need of interpreter and the possibility of distrust i had learned their own tongue they could talk with me directly and they soon were coming oftener and farther to do it from the beginning among these visitors had appeared many panditas scribes and priests men of solemn dignity and preoccupied mien they made a great show of silence but notwithstanding this i could see that in reality by look gesture and occasional word they generally directed the speech of the dato whom they accompanied they touched so often upon religious matters and customs that i had quickly felt the need of being informed on the subject of mohammedan teaching especially concerning conduct and foreign relations i accordingly primed myself at once and was soon astonishing the panditas who were themselves really ignorant of their religion with my learned talk crammed for the occasion from sales's translation of the koran with the moros in spanish times religion had been the greatest stumbling block in their view the koran was the whole law established long ago in the days of the prophet so that change and innovation in anything that it governed and it governed all things were not only unnecessary but wrong now we the americans had not like the spaniards come talking a new religion we had the correct moro theory of disease moreover we had as it were slipped up on their weak human side by appealing to their love of gain and by keeping them employed had even kept their thoughts from the usual fanatical channels into which they were wont to turn on meeting new things in short before the moros knew it they had been surprised juggled out of their usual position and on this one point of religion where we had expected the greatest difficulty we were on account of a little study and pains i almost said trick not only to have none but were to meet with real assistance in getting control of the bulk of the moros religion is the one thing if there is any that faintly holds together the incoherent groups of the race after many visits from less important priests came the chief and most reverend one in all lanao an old and very shrewd man i received and treated him with great dignity and show of respect and talked the koran with him as long as he pleased delighted with his first reception he came again and often in a few months he was my stanch friend and he was sending letters and messages to his people many of whom were now either preparing for war or had already been committing acts of war against the americans he told them that he spoke the will of allah ta allah god it was that they live in peace and accept the americans he assured them that the americans also like the moros knew the will of allah ta allah and the words of the prophet with this old man i advised on many subjects and one of his last acts with me was to rise to my great surprise in a grand assembly of his people a year after our first meeting and solemnly announce it as the will of god made known to him that the americans rule over the moro people and tax them to the fifth of all their goods he could have given no greater proof of loyalty for the rock on which his people split was taxes for nearly a year the presence of the americans contact with them observation 
the example they offered of order obedience and government the practice which in working with the americans the moros themselves received in obedience order industry and responsibility were lessons to the moros preparatory to government which was to follow on many these lessons were unmistakably having the desired effect on others not the latter committed against the americans every aggression that treachery and stealth could devise sentinels were stabbed in the dark lone soldiers ambushed cut up and killed small parties attacked tents tools and arms stolen and carried away our patience long left these things unpunished hoping that with time and a better comprehension of us the moros would of themselves see the folly of continuing such acts on the contrary as the road went deeper and deeper into the moro country these aggressions became worse and more frequent our enemies and even our friends began to think we were afraid unpunished enjoying to the full at our expense the gratification of their moro love of lawlessness our enemies taunted our friends with a foolish self-denial in abstaining from the sport the friends felt and protested that we were making no difference between good and bad between friend and foe they demanded and indeed it was right that a distinction should be made there was therefore better feeling when one morning all learned that we had surprised in his mountains captured the arms destroyed the rendezvous and scattered the band of data matuan whose followers as all moros knew had beset and robbed the american camps this was emphasized when a few days later after wandering all night through the forest and mountains and wading lakes and marshes we had captured the fort and had utterly wiped out the band of the sultan of berimbingan his people under pretence of selling fruit had treacherously approached cut up and disabled for life an american soldier jeeringly referring to the american slowness to act against their enemies he had answered my demand for redress by saying that he would take my message under consideration for some months and then let me know whether he would talk about the matter at all but respect grew when the news spread of a score dead in the town of bacayuan whose people had killed a soldier for the purpose of robbery and who when called upon for justice had first ignored and then fortifying the town had defied the americans nothing that happened between americans and moros was hidden for the sake of instruction and effect moros were made to know or hear all and in these expeditions the effect was increased in moro eyes by the fact that the americans had distinguished well and no friendly moro had suffered at their hands there was in consequence a wider call for american flags as a symbol of friendship it was enough punitive measures were thereupon stopped they were stopped out of policy also with a view to the future pacification of even the bad moros on the knowledge that with them it is revenge an eye for an eye to the end of time without regard to how justly he who first lost an eye deserved to lose it for this reason a kill and burn policy can never succeed with moros can do nothing more than destroy them these object lessons had gradually with the passage of time brought many villages and settlements to peaceful recognition of the american commander as their common superior as this process went on it brought to light the miserable conditions under which these savages had always lived willing yet of themselves helpless to throw them off i was overwhelmed with a flood of complaints requests to adjudicate claims settle disputes and differences between different datos and villages punish countless robberies burnings murders and woundings for which there had never in moro history been any other tribunal than war and counter-aggression the story led back as far as tradition goes and opened a broad field of work too broad for one man it was plain that here at least near the road the preparations for government had outrun the provision of machinery for its operation 
however something had to be done i therefore quietly assumed the functions of law-maker ruler and judge ruled and settled disputes and differences on my own judgment and knowledge of conditions the law was scarcely of record neither was the old english common law and the government was somewhat informal but like all simple folk moros seemed to prefer personality to form in government fortunately too with my clients exact justice according to civilized ideas was not necessary nor in demand moro's ideas of justice were from their history tradition and lives naturally hazy and faint not to say nil it was more important here that there be some law than that it be perfect some decision and end of controversy than that they be just my dictum was therefore accepted in general by the moros near soon however the rumour of these things spreading acts in intentional contempt and defiance of them as representing the growing american authority began to be committed by remoter dattos military men stationed among them need never seek occasions of quarrels with moros moro ignorance folly and perversity can be relied upon to furnish plenty of occasions and such occasions as cannot be ignored or pardoned two such were now forced upon me the sultan of Dets and amongst the most powerful moros under threat of war to the bitter end was required to make full apology and to cut off his son from the succession to the sultanate for public and boastful abuse of the american flag it was a fit and effective though severe punishment the second was even worse one morning i surprised and captured and soon had tried and sentenced to seventeen years imprisonment two dattos who to show their disregard and contempt of what the americans had enjoined had made against filipinos a successful slave-taking expedition by sea under the american flag which they had somehow managed to get hold of with the moros restraint of personal liberty is the most grievous of all things it is inflicted for no crime however great and is allowed for but one cause insanity the punishment of the two dattos therefore spoke straight to the moro heart and all were made to hear it death were far preferable the abused flag came into my hands along with the dattos that was the latest no doubt it will be the last time that the american flag will cover a slave-taking expedition the road had now been finished in its concluding stages the competition among the moros for the work for the opportunity to earn money had become so sharp as to be troublesome dattos were quarrelling with one another about it and once started at work at a given point they were so self-willed and determined that they could hardly be stopped to be directed elsewhere the road-work ended the danger of idleness arose for it had now become evident to me that moros could be managed in two ways only by putting them at work and keeping them at work or by putting them in fear and keeping them in fear there is no possibility of living in quiet with unoccupied or uncowed moros i preferred the method of work on my offer to hire them now to fetch supplies from the sea-coast there were repeated all the doubt hesitation and delay of the time when they first began work upon the road complicated this time by fear that the americans might try to make them carry bacon or something that contained some product of the hog to the mohammedan the lowest and vilest of things accursed by god and the prophet after repeated reassurances on this point they began at first to make sure they would carry only flour but the work proved profitable and became most popular then they took box stuff then canned stuff then ceased to question what every man wisely curbing his curiosity holding his tongue carrying all things that came and bacon at last among the rest assuredly the leaven of new ideas was working gradually in the past few months the moros had accepted much and this demonstrated their readiness to accept more of what was american the time seemed opportune to give more form to this beginning of control accordingly the writer was duly appointed governor of the now moros with a small staff and a scheme of government somewhat like that 
obtaining over the rest of the philippines its defects were manifest at the very first effort to put it in operation it failed to turn to account to place itself at the head of the weak but only organization in all moral land the dato group and to lay hold of the only power known to moros the authority of the dato on a small scale and imperfectly i had already had a government in operation in the only way that government can for years be operated among the moros one man power without formality backed by force and a knowledge of the conditions and exercised upon the people through their dattos as the law for the new government did not contain these essential provisions it would not work but the little machinery of government which had previously been set up went on working quietly until the new law by amendment adapted itself to the requirements of conditions and the governor became de jour what he had already long been de facto father adviser judge sheriff ruler lawmaker with the dattos as his subalterns and assistants formal acceptance of government was naturally regarded by the moros as a serious step even where they had already in effect been living under that same government for some months reasons were demanded i therefore held meetings to explain and satisfy all argument was made as varied and as different as the dattos themselves here came in profitably the knowledge which i had gradually been acquiring of each and every one's circumstances and history for one it was sufficient to point out that americans had not bothered his religion or his women for another that he had suffered no injustice from us as he had from other moros filipinos or spaniards for this one that tribal wars in which his people had almost been wiped out had been stopped by the americans for that one that we had suppressed the thieves who had been robbing him of his women and goods it was enough to remind the sultan of sungud how he and his people had prospered by the americans and the doctor of punad that he was wearing rich clothes since we came it satisfied some that we had not come and tried to place over them the filipinos upon whom the moros look with contempt as the immemorial source of their slave supply and with hatred as their traditional enemies and others that we had already adjusted and would go on adjusting it was the purpose of the government to adjust differences and punishing wrongs between the different groups of the moros and so wipe out the sudden deadly attacks by one another from which all had suffered and of which all stood in constant dread before the americans came among them why do you want this and what do you come here for anyhow questioned at one of these meetings the old sultan of Bayabao after i had just finished dealing out quinine to him and his begging retinue one raw rainy day we are satisfied as we are he added vehemently as he sat shivering in bare feet thin shirt and flimsy trousers before me well warmly and dryly clad have you such shoes and clothes as i to warm your body and protect your feet or have you such medicines as i have just given you to cure your sickness i answered do you know how to make them he was silent and the great crowd listened we do and have come to show you that is why to this day he and his people have not fought the americans nor resisted their government it pleased and convinced many when i pointed out and emphasized what they already knew that now with a security hitherto unknown to them they were able to travel through all lanao such were the reasons given and they were pointed out and patiently repeated as the direct good which had already come and of which more was to be expected from the power and authority of the americans they won over gradually without war half of all the malanaos and government went on taking on more form but the most numerous warlike and inaccessible tribe under the most influential hereditary sultan of all remained stubbornly hostile and aggressive in twos and threes his people prowled about and by cunning stealth and lying in wait lost no opportunity to rob assault stab kill they would accept nothing the americans said for while with most men it is credulity with moros it seems to be incredulity that goes with the ignorance of the world 
to them accustomed to see men governed only by desires and passions it was inconceivable that the americans bore these aggressions from any other cause than fear or weakness tradition and experience were all against such an idea to them whose largest example of power had been a dato who could muster a few hundred men it was wholly incredible and they ridiculed the idea that the united states could bring against them any more men or arms than they had already brought to them it was inconceivable that any man who could would not without more ado destroy his enemy that the americans had not done this meant therefore that the americans could not do it to talk to them of power without exercising it or of punishment without executing it was taken as mere vaporing to my persuasion demands and threats alike therefore their dattos sent jeering replies or answered me with worse aggressions the last straw was the murder of four soldiers by stealth to secure their arms then followed a deadly punitive expedition it carried surprise and astonishment a fearful lesson to foolish boastful savages whose ideas of war were one thousand and of power three thousand years behind their age this was the last argument and to my next invitation not only those who had been punished but the few others who had stood aloof declared their readiness and in a short time came under the new government in organizing them wherever they could be won over and had made full submission those dattos who had led in hostility were appointed to authority over their people under the united states for history shows that such men under the conqueror and whether the conqueror wills it or no remained the strong spirits and real rulers of their country violent changes were thus avoided all had now come under american authority and the work of inducing them to accept government was practically finished there was however one thing that still stuck in the throats of all choking and gagging even those who willingly and peacefully had long been living under the new order this was the question of taxation a delicate subject a last test with moros because it is a matter of religion there had been much talk and murmur of this through all the tribes and groups therefore i again held a meeting at which were assembled all the sultans dattos and men of consequence for question and discussion i laid before them all the reasons it appealed to the dattos who had been appointed to offices over their people to say that we must have money to pay them but these were very few again for the common good i said to punish criminals and catch thieves but the common good had little meaning for men who had known no government no race publica nothing common let every man care for himself was their idea in all their experience taxes stood for what had been wrung for selfish purposes by the strong from the weak by conqueror from conquered by master from his bondman and money paid for any other cause than direct barter and sale meant tribute a horrible thing of subjection dishonor and slavery that good should be alleged of taxation was incomprehensible that it was intended for the good of those who paid it was past belief all their experience and tradition were contrary to such a thing public spirit could not be appealed to for a long habit of life in minute communities had effectually throttled the budding of such a feeling and left only selfishness yet i felt no uncertainty as to the ultimate outcome of the matter for by experience i had learned that in all things whatsoever to the last the white man outclasses and can always find some intellectual way to go around a moro in this matter it came thus the moros like all other natives of the philippines are possessed of a consuming desire to carry a pass some sort of an official certificate as to character home business and the like of the bearer and they are willing to pay any amount therefore and never think of it as taxation on this weak point the moros showed the first signs of yielding then the plan of indirect taxation caught pleased and overcame them as it catches wiser men than they imported cotton cloth paying duty at the custom-house had long been reaching the moros through a few coast traders and was now in large use among all moros 
touching the jacket of the nearest datto you are a lot of foolish and ignorant children i said you are haggling about paying taxes when you have already been doing it for years and have actually been giving the americans money to pay me to pay the interpreter and all my soldiers this at once caught their attention the explanation followed they understood it remarkably quickly they saw the humour and the truth of the thing and wondering at the finesse that had been able to make them contribute to their own subjugation yielded in a sort of nonplussed way feeling no doubt that it was useless to hope to escape a people who could devise such a smart system of getting money from other people without the latter's even knowing it to my help also at this juncture came my old friend the priest naskalim the metropolitan as it were of lanao with if not a revelation something better wisdom to his people it is the will of allah to allah the merciful who has many names in these ways government and civilization have gained upon them End of section one hundred and thirty seven this recording is in the public domain recording by jim locke of floyd virginia section one hundred thirty eight of china japan and the islands of the pacific read for librivox dot org by monica m c baro buddha an ancient temple of java photograph page five hundred sixty two all that is known of the early history of java is that before the eleventh century the island had made a long advance on the path of civilization this civilization was derived from the hindus and was accompanied by the worship of buddha a few centuries later came the hindu muhammadans as merchants or settlers and also as missionaries later still hindu intercourse with europeans began this was first carried on by the east india company of holland and the dutch gradually extended their rule although from eighteen eleven to eighteen sixteen the island was in the hands of the english at first the dutch looked upon java in the familiar fashion of the eighteenth century in regard to colonies that is simply as places from which revenue might be obtained but since eighteen seventy an effort has been made to govern the land in the interest of the javanese as well as the dutch the buddhist temple of baro buddha ranks among the architectural wonders of the world originally a hill of lava about one hundred and fifty feet high it was hewn by the ancient hindu builders into six mighty terraces of which the lowest is six hundred feet square surmounted by a host of bell-shaped cupolas and crowded with sculptures if the statues and bas reliefs of this temple were placed side by side they would extend three miles taken together they form a gigantic object lesson of the teachings of buddha ascending the terrace the worshipper passed first through scenes of domestic and outdoor life men shooting with blowpipes or bows and arrows musicians playing bagpipes fishermen with nets and rods etc as he ascended the statues grew more and more religious in character until a length having passed through the stages of instruction and left the things of the world far beneath him he was ready to enter the apex of the temple and behold with enlightened eyes the image of buddha left unfinished as a symbol of the inability of human art to realize or represent perfection End of section one hundred thirty eight this recording is in the public domain section one hundred thirty nine of china japan and the islands of the pacific read for librivox dot org by monica m c detail of temple at prambanan photograph page five hundred sixty two at prambanan not far from baro buddha there stand in the midst of the tropical jungle the remains of an immense group of buddhist temples although in ruins these temples fill the beholder with awe as he considers the amount of labor represented by the elaborate carvings and statues such as these shown in the illustration with which every part of the hundreds of buildings in this vast group is covered 
End of section 139. This recording is in the public domain. Section 140 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandra. The World Story, Volume 1, China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 140. A Visit to a Headhunter of Borneo by William Henry Furness III. Borneo is the fifth largest island in the world. Even now only a comparatively small portion of it has been explored, although Portugal, Spain, Holland and England have all had commercial interests in the country. The northern part is now under an English protectorate. The southern is governed by the Dutch through the native chiefs. The Editor Aben Avid sat beside us, and while we were filling our pipes, he produced from the baboo box, hanging at his side, some tobacco and some of that beautifully dried leaf of the wild banana cut from the heart of the plant before the leaf is unfurled. In unskilled hands, it hairs like wet tissue paper, but in Aben Avid's, a tapering, symmetrical cigarette, eight inches long, was skilfully rolled on his thigh. A circle of small boys squatted around us, their bright little eyes watching our every movement as intently as we stare at the actions of some strange animal in a zoological garden. If we struck a match, or sneezed, or buttoned our coats, or wiped our faces with a handkerchief, dilated eyes and open mouths attended the action with rapt interest. A few men sat near their chief, and now and then murmured comments to one another in their native tongue, which we did not fully understand, but could guess from the direction of their eyes that we were the subject of their conversation. The evening duties of the household were not, however, interrupted on our account. Men with bundles of dried firewood on their shoulders, women staggering under a load of bamboo joints filled with water and stacked in hampers on their backs, were constantly passing by us treading heavily, and making the loose boards of the floor clatter and rattle as they plodded their weary way to the apartments. For a time, there was almost a constant succession of canoes coming to the landing place, bringing back the workers from the rice clearings, the women all bending under full hampers, some with fresh, uncurled fern fronds, and the sprouts of a variety of large canna, which they stew with rice, to add variety to their diet some with bundles of the young banana leaf whereof to make cigarette wrappers and others with wild tapioca and wild yams each one carried her own light pedal in one hand and the large round and flat sun hat in the other none of them glanced to right or left but made her way direct to her family room and like a ghost faded into the darkness through the small doorway after them followed the men, dangling their parangs in one hand and trailing their blowpipes and spears in the other. They, too, looked fixedly ahead, until they had hung up their parangs and stuck their spears perpendicularly into a rafter so that the shaft should be kept straight. This done, they joined the group round the fire, or went down to the river to bathe. At the far end of the house, some young fellows were playing mournful tunes on the kaluri, and its organ-like notes were wafted fitfully down to us. Now and then a baby's wail chimed in, and then was quieted by the mother's crooning lullaby. Beneath the house the contented grunting of pigs and the clucking of chickens denoted that these omen-givers had returned from their foraging in the jungle and had sought the shelter of home for the night. Thus we sat as twilight faded in Eben Avid's veranda, in the home of these people, were of every detail made up their familiar, commonplace life. The only life from cradle to grave that they had ever known or would know, while we, by their side, were aliens from a world twelve thousand miles away, from a country that they had never heard of, and of a race which many of them had never seen before. We were in the very heart of the Bornean jungle, guests in the house of a barbarous, savage, 
and bloodthirsty headhunter but these terms when applied at that moment to our host what misnomers could contrast be more emphatic than the perfect peacefulness of our surroundings and the thought that a man as benignant and hospitable as aben avid should cherish as his highest aim in life to add every year to that cluster of human heads hanging from the rafters just above us and gently swaying in the heat ascending from the flames is it conceivable that this gentle-hearted man and his circle of good-humoured friends could take pride and pleasure in recognising and rehearsing the slashes and gashes borne by each head the long gash there on the left side of that skull showing through the piece of old casting net was made by tama lohong's parang the very one with carved wooden handle that he carries to this day the owner of the next skull was fishing when he fell a victim to the stealthy thrust from a poised spear this small one is that of a young girl who tried to escape from the rear of the house when they burned out those madangs way over near the rejang river thus they can enumerate them all chief and slave man woman girl and boy it all seemed so at variance with aben avid's genial courteous hospitality that i wondered if it were possible to look at these skulls through his eyes and to sympathize with his thrill of pride and exultation in them i waited until aben avid had his cigarette fairly rolled and lit and then trying not to appear in the least antagonistic lest i should fail to elicit his genuine feeling i asked o oh, sabila blood brother why is it that all you people of kalamantan kill each other and hang up these heads in the land i come from such a thing is never known i fear that it would be ill spoken of there indeed perhaps thought quite horrible what does aben avid think of it he turned to me in utter absolute surprise at first with eyes half closed as doubting that he heard aright and letting the smoke curl slowly out of his mouth for a moment he then replied with unwonted vehemence no tuan no the custom is not horrible it is an ancient custom a good beneficent custom bequeathed to us by our fathers and our fathers fathers it brings us blessings plentiful harvests and keeps off sickness and pains those who were once our enemies hereby become our guardians our friends our benefactors but i interrupted how does aben avid know that these dried heads do all this don't you make it an excuse just because you like to shed blood and to kill hatuan you white man had no great chief like tokong to show you what was right haven't you ever heard the story of tokong and his people he was raja of the sibops and the father of all the kayans and lived long 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 ago i was not acquainted with the story of tokong so i begged him to relate it then squatting on the floor with his forearm slightly resting on his knees and his hands dangling in front of him he meditatively relit his cigarette and gazing lovingly up at the cluster of skulls began it was in the old old days long before the government came here by the government i mean our tuan raja brook it happened that on a time the descendant of the heaven-born katira murai tokong and his men of the sibob tribe were on an expedition down river to punish a household of thieves who had stolen their crop of rice the year before and had chased tokong's women and children from the jungle clearings it was the time of year when the fields had just been planted and before the rice had sprouted so tokong took out his warriors to teach these thieves that this year there should be no more stealing when they had gone down river to the great bamboo clump where they had to cross through the jungle they drew their canoes up to the bank and with tokong leading started on their stealthy march when the eye of day looked straight down at them over their heads they rested on the bank of a small stream which ran round that great rock perhaps to one you have seen it we call it batu kusieng near the headwaters of the belaga and tinjar rivers they had cooked and eaten and drawn out the pegs of wood whereon their rice pots rested and raja tokong was slipping his head 
through his war coat and girding on his parang when he heard coming from under the great rock a squeaking croaking voice uttering wonka cock teta batok footnote aben avid did not translate this and i believe it is ancient kayan retained for its onomatopoeic sound End of footnote. he paused and turning round to listen to the voice saw a large frog with its young ones about it sitting just under the edge of the rock greetings to you cop frog said the raja what is the meaning of your croaking and cop replied alas what fools you sibops are you go out to battle and kill men but you take back with you to ornament your shields only their hair whereas did you but know it if you took the whole head you would have blessings beyond words in sooth you heavy livered people know not how to take a head look here and i will show you this spoke cop and straightway seized one of his little ones and with one stroke of his parang cut off its head tokong was exceedingly angry at the impudence and the cruelty of the frog and paying no further attention to it ordered his men to advance at once but some of the older men among them could not help thinking that perhaps cop spoke the truth and that night while they sat round the fire holding a council of war over the attack on the enemy's house close at hand they urged tokong to allow them to follow the frog's advice at first tokong still very angry because cop had called the sibops fools and heavy livered refused but finally seeing that many of his best men were in favour of it he granted their request next morning when the sky began to turn grey and the birds in the trees were just waking up the sibops noiselessly carried armfuls of bark and grass and placed them beneath the thieves house and set fire to them and the flames ran quickly everywhere out rushed the men and women some jumping into the flames others trying to slide down the house posts but all were met with slashes and stabs from the swords and spears of tokong's men many were killed that day and the heads of three were cut off and carried away by tokong's party who retreated at once and almost before they knew it were at the landing place on the river to their great amazement they found their boats all ready and launched no sooner were they seated than the boats began to move off of their own accord right upstream in the direction of home it was a miracle the current of the stream changed and ran uphill as it does at flood tide at the mouth of a river they almost immediately reached the landing place close to their house and were overjoyed to see that the crops planted only fifteen days before had not only sprouted but had grown had ripened and were almost ready for the harvest in great astonishment they hurried to the clearings and up to their house there they found still greater wonders those who were ill when the party set out were now well the lame walked and the blind saw raja tokong and all his people were convinced on the spot that it was because they had followed cop's advice and they vowed a vow that ever afterward the heads of their enemies should be cut off and hung up in their houses this is the story of raja tokong tuan we all follow his good example these heads above us have brought me all the blessings i have ever had i would not have them taken from my home for all the silver in the country he turned to appeal to his people sitting near and they as many as understood malai nodded their heads glancing from him to us and murmuring betul betul tis true tis true he paused to get an ember out of the glowing heap of ashes to light his cigarette again which had become much crumpled during the narration of raja tokong's first head hunt and after he had it once more in shape i asked him if he would not regard it as somewhat of an inconvenience if his own head were to be cut off just to bring blessings to an enemy's house to one he replied i do not want to become dead any more than i want to move from where i am if my head were cut off my second self would go to bulun matai the fields of the dead where beyond a doubt i should be happy the dayongs tell us and surely they know that those who have been brave and have taken heads as i have will be respected in that other world 
and will have plenty of riches. When I die, my friends will beat the gongs loud and shout out my name, so that those who are already in Balloon Matai will know that I am coming and meet me when I cross over the stream on Bintang Sikopa, the great log. I shall be glad enough to see them, but I don't want to go today, nor tomorrow. His faith seemed immovable, but I could not resist the temptation of suggesting a doubt, so I asked him, what if the Dayongs were wrong, and there were no Bulun Matai, and that when he stopped breathing, he really died and knew no more? He answered me almost with scorn for such a doubt. Tuan, nothing really dies. It changes from one thing to another. The Dayongs must be right, for they have been to the fields of the dead and come back to tell us all about it. Don't you feel sorry, I asked, for those that you kill? It hurts badly to be cut by a parang. You don't like it, and those whom you cut down dislike it as much as you do. They are no more anxious to go to Apolegan or Longjulan, regions of Bulun Matai, than you are. Ha, Tuan, he replied, with the suggestion of a patronizing chuckle in his voice. You feel just as I did when I was a little boy and had never seen blood. But I outgrew such feelings, as everyone should. End of section 140 End of The World's Story A History of the World in Story, Song and Art Volume 1 China, Japan and the Islands of the Pacific Edited by Eva March Tappan